Welcome in to a Wednesday edition of the Jordy Collada Show That's live here <laughs> on the UDL from the UDL. We're going to talk to Chef Jean-Paul Bourgeois one hour from now. So get your food questions available or get them in to the bunker. YouTube, Facebook, or JordyColladaShow.com. You can get your comments in. We will get them to the chef coming up here at 8 a.m. this morning. 8.30 this morning. Rohan Davey's supposed to be Ta-da, here. We'll see. We'll see. He's turning into the we'll shade. See. That's right. He's turning into shade. We'll see. This text message chain with me is pretty funny. I'll be there tomorrow. I'll be there tomorrow. I'll be there tomorrow. 8.30 every time. That's right. We'll see if Rohan can make it through. 8.30 this morning. Then at 8.45, Nick Underhill of New Orleans.Football. The uh, premier site for all the Saints news. If you're looking for top-of-the-line Saints news, the latest, which there has been a ton coming out of training camp down in Metairie for the Saints. We will talk to Underhill about the latest, and it does not involve Mike Thomas. There is another (laughs) storyline brewing down in New Orleans. They're losing a cornerback. Many thought they were going to draft a cornerback in the... uh, uh, with one of their top picks, just because that was a position of need for the New Orleans Saints. And now Patrick Robinson informs the franchise that he's stepping away from the game. He's retiring at 33 years old. No injury, just was gotten to a point, had gotten to a point in his career that thought it was his time to step away. Inform Sean Payton, Mickey Loomis, and Dennis Lausha on, uh, on Tuesday morning, and they make the announcement Tuesday afternoon, they're looking for another cornerback. <laughs> oh, he looked around the room and said, mighty thin here, boys. Might as well get out of here while, you know, while he's just doing the, uh, the Kansas City shuffle. Everybody's focused on Michael Thomas. I'll go slide out the back door. Yes. Here's my papers. I'm gone. They won't talk about this at all. Wow. So a, uh, another story for the New Orleans Saints that we will talk about with Nick Underhill coming up here at 845 this morning. The USA Today coaches poll. Has been published. LSU in the top 15. Makes everybody oh, angry. We will talk about that. Um, does it? The coaches' poll? We'll get into it later. Yeah, we'll get I've into got it some later. thoughts on the polls. I mean, it makes everybody weird, don't you think? Uh, everybody gets uptight about the coaches' poll. Yeah, I think for us, it's just a, it's something to talk about. Oh, without well, a doubt. Yeah, yeah, it gives yeah. us something to talk but, about. But, I mean... Nobody can really put real stock into this stuff. But they do, do at the beginning yes, of the year. They've they got do. a number next to their name, and it Ole turns. Miss that's what does. shapes. That's and what shapes the. Fall the right yes, the but that's what game. shapes the playoff. Oh, I see your angle now. <laughs> oh, I don't know what. Yeah, she, she has an agenda. I do not. <laughs> I see your angle. The only thing I'll ever remember about a preseason poll would be Matthew Stafford, AJ Green, and that Georgia Bulldog no, Sean team. Marino. No Sean Marino being preseason number one and them having a parade in Athens. Oh. Like they actually <laughs> celebrated being preseason number <laughs> one. Yes, I mean, <laughs> you can so look it weird. up. They had like convertibles going down Sorority <laughs> Row. Like a problem. Where they were like, yes, like celebrating the fact that we're preseason number one. And I, I want to say that they finished the season with like four losses. How does that get out? Like the like, how, what meeting do you have with like your social media teams? Like, how does they get out the door? Like, no, we're not doing that. No way. We're not <laughs> like, doing that. Who approved Who that? that? So, I mean, like, even if I'm the AD, I'm stepping in and saying, "Hey, Rick, yeah, I mean, pump the brakes." Uh, no, yeah. not pump the brakes. We're pulling the plug on this. <laughs> we're not doing this. Send the cars back. We're gonna be a laughing stock, and you better not lose a game. I mean, you want to talk about pressure? Throw a parade preseason, it's the buddy. Miami Heat. I mean, yes, I mean, it is. That's a flex. It absolutely is. Um, Georgia, be damn good. Georgia's still national championship list since 1980. Well, I'm gonna have to push back a little bit. They've won the national championship of recruiting a couple of years in a they row. They do. They and dominate they February. They celebrate that. They dominate people February. People think this might be their year, though. Yes, a lot of people do. I mean, I've, I've heard. I feel like I've heard that before, though. J Boy. Yeah. Yeah. J Boy loves him. Uh, somebody else the other day, I was I, I was listening to that had. SEC ties love Georgia and thought they were going to win that. the national I mean, they're championship. They're the flavor like, of the month before the season starts wow. every year. JT Daniels, he makes great me mustache. I don't know about his look. He looks something. Yeah. He's got very <laughs> pensive lips, and that's just not a quarterback feature. I, I Is approve he from of. California. Is he yeah. in California? Yeah. Uh, it looks like he, he looks mighty pale for being yeah. from California. <laughs> I agree. I Must agree. use that sunblock like I do. Looks like Lloyd coming <laughs> back from vacation. <laughs> he's got that middle part too. He does, uh, but does he? it doesn't mm-hmm. play. Wow. He's got a middle part. It doesn't play. So are you a Georgia fan? No. Just a middle part fan. I'm not even a middle part fan. That just started with that Tom Brady's, like, the pre-TB12 Tom Brady look. And y'all took that and ran with yeah, it. Yeah, 05-ish. 
Oh five. His Brady, middle part. Brady kind of looks like a scientist, like kind of like a professor. He does. Now he looks like an alien. <laughs> now he looks just like somebody's, a supermodel. Somebody, no, he's getting too. He's turned. Yeah, I think he's turned the corner. He's getting too. His skin is too tight against his face. He looks what? like. Uh, I don't think we can criticize him quite. Uh, yet. Yeah. When Mars attacks, that's what he looks like. He looks like <laughs> one of those aliens. Blasphemy. Yeah, I'm telling you, he's mean, just, he looks a little weird. He's beautiful. Are you jealous? I think no. The, 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 I mean, the older he gets, I mean, he's the younger he definitely looks. He's like J-Lo. more better looking the older he gets. Yes, but I think he's, he's getting, saving. he's turning, he's turning the corner if it's too much. His eyes are sucked into his head. Yes. I mean, all these rich people with their. They just take it one step too far. Yeah. But he still looks great. They I mean, found, he's still they, a 10. They found that fountain of youth, though. Yes, it's he expensive, did. I bet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Swerve, Georgia, Oklahoma, the championship is my pick. Swerve drinking the sauce. All SEC. A lot of people drinking the uh, the, the, the Georgia flavor going into the season. They are. Um, so we'll talk about the USA Today coaches poll coming up here. Saints news again, as we said. LSU back out on the field yesterday afternoon. We'll give a... A little bit of a report. Brody Miller's got a great write-up over at The Athletic on uh, some of the things that have stood out to him, some of the things that he has seen early on in training camp. LSU's got a day off here today, so nothing happening today. I believe they have a team meeting at 4 o'clock this afternoon, but no on-field activities uh, as this will be the first true day off for LSU here in preseason camp. Uh, And uh, as we said, we'll talk to Chef Jean-Paul Bourgeois coming up here at 8 a.m., so if you've got food questions, Jump inside of the bunker, get over to jordycoladashow.com, hit us on Facebook, get your questions in. We will get them asked and answered coming up here by the chef at 8 o'clock this morning. Then Rohan's supposed to be here at 8.30. We'll talk to him about the latest of LSU football. Get uh, get get his thoughts on this wide receiver core because the more that we talk about him, uh, and I don't know if you followed us on social media. If you do follow us on social media, you saw the Chris Hilton basketball highlights that we put up yesterday. The baseline move he makes, and also, that's as a sophomore. (laughs) I mean, that's not senior film. He is a 10th grader when he makes that baseline move, and I mean... He's, his head is above the rim. He's going up higher when he gets to the rim. I like, mean, he's, he's simply not just jumping. like pokes that thing like a professional. I mean, that looks like a professional dunk. Without a doubt. I mean, just the way that he just kind of pokes it, gets above the rim. I mean, because that started because we were talking about the wide receivers yesterday, and I, all of them are going to play. Like, it's, it feels like all of these wide receivers are going to play. Everybody from Jack Besh to Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, Chris Hilton, Deion Smith, all of these cats are going to play. Sometimes it's it, it, you have to you have to regulate the news that you get back from some of the people that you trust at LSU football or even some of the things that you watch out there and you come back and you report them on these true freshmen. Because a lot of these guys pop, they're new faces on the field, they're eager to be out there. It's early on in camp, and you know a lot of these reports I've come back, whether it be on radio or whether it be on podcast, and say, I don't know how these true freshmen don't play just by going out there and watching. And you go through the first couple of weeks of the season, and those guys can't get onto the field. And it's because there's a barrier of trust that has to happen between coach and player before the coach can really look at you on a Saturday and say, get out there and go play you know, first half, first series, real meaningful snaps. But when you look at this wide receiver core as true freshmen, and again, there is a question mark behind Kayshawn Butte on who's going to be the second playmaker on this offense. Who's it going to be? And it could be a mixture of somebody like John Trey Kirkland, Jare Jenkins, Trey Palmer, John Emery, Ty Davis Price. I mean... One of those combination of veterans, but it seems like these freshmen, these new faces, are definitely going to have some type of input on it. Like, they're going to be on the field just by watching the way that these guys practice. I mean, the way that they... You can tell, in my opinion, the way that a coach talks to a player if he's going to play or not. Almost the way that he coaches him. He coaches him with a little bit more urgency. You can see the way that DJ Mangus and Jake Peets are talking to Jack Besh, to Brian Thomas, 
to Chris Hilton that they have they've got expectation for these guys to play. Deion Smith, who was here in the spring, who continues to kind of be like under the radar, but then when you pay attention to him, you're like, sheesh. I mean, six. How, how do you? How does he not play? How, how does he not get reps on this offense where they're looking for pass catchers? And this guy looks like that. I mean, all of them. I'm telling you, the one to me that looks most like a freshman is Besh. And it, and it seems like Besh is going to be a starter. I was going to say, he's the one that's definitely going to be out there. But when you look at them physically, if you're just looking at them physically, if you just line them up and stack them down the line, I mean, it would take until Besh that you would really say, is he a fr- are these guys freshmen? I mean, like, Brian Thomas looks like an upperclassman. I mean, just by the way that he, he he's still got a lot to fill out on his frame. I mean, he's still very long. He's tall. I mean, he's going to have to put on some muscle mass to sustain the SEC schedule once he becomes an every-down player for LSU. But as a true freshman, he doesn't look like a true freshman. Malik Neighbors is one of these, like, physically Whoa. freak. Yes, like, geez, look at this guy. Um, Hilton is another one that is, you know, he, he looks young. He still has, like, a baby face, right? But, I mean... Physically, when you see him just run and move, you're like, I mean, damn. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't look like a first year player, you know. I mean, he's definitely got a lot to learn in the system. He's got a lot to learn about playing college football. He's still got to go on the road in a big time environment on a Saturday and see it and smell it and make plays in it and get rocked. Understand? Yeah, got to get. Yeah, you got to get popped a couple of times because that's when you'll find out when the fresh who the freshman or freshman going over the middle one time you get sawed in half. You're like, all right, I, maybe I don't want to be out here as much as I thought I did. And, there's and that's going, what's going to happen. And, and there's going to be those moments. There's going to be those moments. But all of these cats, this freshman class, which has been tabbed the best freshman recruiting class in the country. When you go out there and see them as a group, it's tough to find a weakness out of all of them. I mean, it just, they, they catch the football. They're really good route runners. They've got really good speed. I mean, as just a group, they check so many boxes of what you're looking for out of production at that position. It's really going to be fun to watch those guys develop. And it's also going to be interesting to see how Mickey Joseph, DJ Mangus, Jake Peets really manages the reps. Because Jeray Jenkins and John Trey Kirkland and, you know, Trey Palmer, if right, those guys got to play too. You know, I mean, they are, they are players that, I, you know, you, you, you have to have. You, you, you have to have somebody step up and be that second option. And I think you would rather it be a veteran. Right, I mean, I don't think you want to put the pressure on a kid like Hilton or Thomas to say, hey, man, we need you to be the guy here versus UCLA if you're LSU. But if you can get through those first couple of weeks and get to conference play, get into the teeth of the SEC schedule with guys like John Trey Kirkland and Trey Palmer making plays and Jeray Jenkins stepping up and making plays, then, then you know, you can kind of take your time on, on the and at some at some point they're going to pop. I'm just saying they're, they're just too good. And when you're worried about a guy like Kayshawn Butte, and then let's say somebody steps up and becomes that second option where you've got to you know, start paying attention and defensively you've got to start scheming to take away two wide receivers now at LSU rather than just one where you're rolling coverage to Kayshawn and now you've got to take that guy that you're rolling and put him over the top of Trey Palmer. Well, then your third best corner, your fourth best cover guy, is covering Chris Hilton, Brian Thomas, Malik Neighbors, Jack Besh, Deion Smith. I'll take the matchup. That's advantage LSU. If you can get somebody's third, fourth, fifth cover guy on one of these cats, they are going to have a Terrace Marshall type season in 2019 where you just look up and you're like, damn, he caught another touchdown. You know, I mean, it's just because they're so worried about Jefferson, they're so worried about Chase, they're so worried about Moss, they're so worried about Edwards Alaire that, you know, this guy's Somebody's just running free. Yeah, you know Alabama. what I mean? I mean, we can't guard this guy. He's just too good. 
And I think some of the freshmen, like you put it, they, they all have somewhat different skill sets. So there are going to be opportunities for them to plug and play and maybe do something that they're just like comfortable doing at this point. You know, like you have Chris Hilton's uh, obviously a go ball guy with his track background. So you just kind of sneak him in the lineup. Maybe they're not aware of how quick he is and he pops one over the top. Like I think it's they're, you're going to see a rotation of these early, like these freshman guys early and just kind of let them get comfortable and do what they do well and then just kind of sprinkle them in. I don't think they have to feel that pressure right away. First scrimmage this Saturday in Tiger Stadium. It'll be it'll be interesting to see some of the reports or hear some of the reports. We won't see anything that comes out of of that scrimmage. But can anyone go to that? Uh, no, no one can. No, uh, just family and 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 the numbers you know, guy. Right, um, he's busy. <laughs> yes, threw for five thousand yards. That's right. That's and ran right. for two hundred and fifty. Um, Defense was awesome though. Um. But no, it's closed to the public, okay. closed to to anybody that uh, closed the media. Um, but you can you can you can figure out kind of what, what went went on. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Ed Ogeron to me is 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 the most transparent head coach in Division One football. I mean, on Tuesday on his radio spot, stop. I mean, he told you that Ty Davis Price is banged up. I mean, he's hurt. I mean, that's that's stuff that really and truly the offensive coordinator. You know what I mean? Like people, they don't want, they really don't want that out there in the public. I mean, you'd rather that not out in the public. UCLA now understands that Ty Davis Price early on in camp is dealing with something. Yeah. Calf. You know, whatever, you know, whatever it is. And, um, I don't think, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. It's, it's not, not that big of a deal. It's not but that what big I'm of an saying, yeah, what you I'm don't, saying you don't is, have to say it. what I'm saying is Saturday, Ogeron will give you some information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he'll come out of that scrimmage and tell you who looked good. Maybe who struggled, who stood out. You know, he'll tell you who's got edges at some of the competition that they're watching. Um, you know, I'm just giving you an example of how transparent yes. it is. I mean, you know, there's a lot of there's there's the majority of Division One head coaches would never come out and tell you that their running back was hurt on radio. He does. You know what I mean? And as at a part of the, as a part of the media, thank I appreciate you. it. Yeah, <laughs> thank know? you. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's. It's good for us. I mean, it gives us something to talk about. Uh, I would recommend that you get over and read Brody Miller's um, latest write-up over at The Athletic uh, where he details the first couple of days of LSU football and kind of just gives you the 411 on what he's heard. You know, just some of the things that, that have been, uh, been discussed. And a lot of uh, what he talks about from the offensive standpoint is, is finding that second option behind Kayshawn Butte. And, and just how impressive that freshman wide receiver class has been here early on in camp. Andrew Brister says, best recruiting class in the country. Hell no. Well, uh, maybe collectively, but it's the best wide receiver recruiting class in the country. Andrew Brister also said in two weeks, LSU gets their first loss. Ah, oh, Andrew, Andrew, I get you. He's trolling Andrew. us. He's trolling. He's trolling and if us. you don't have tickets to games yet, we need to remind you, go to gnosports.com slash win and get your raffle tickets for every home game. Saints, LSU, Pelicans, Tulane. You name it. You name it. We bought four yesterday. Yes, oh. it is. Um, Can't stop. It's an incredible giveaway. It is um, unbelievable. Thanks to everybody for supporting our show. Before we get into everything, I know that we yes. got into a lot of the LSU football stuff, but Majestic Coffee. Brought to you every day, roasted in New Orleans, deliciousips.com. Our water is True Blue Water, T R E U, bluewater.com. We need some more of those bottles. Yes. We got to get do. more. Two weeks to LSU, you got to get your tailgate bottles from truebluewater.com. We need more, too. And Tom Granning provides our snacks from GoMart. That's right, GoMart over in uh, in Natchez, Mississippi. We're low on those too. And if you're uh, going to California, <laughs> you probably want to bring your own water because they are always suffering from a water shortage. Oh, so okay. you know, watch yourself over Thank there. You but you, you can't know. travel you with would. water. Yeah, you can't. Well, you, you know, hey, Katie, people bring what? a thousand <laughs> things of all the places you're not supposed you to. Can't I think go you get security some water. with a bottle of water. You can carry on or you know ship it. Uh, um, all of I our guests. Blue water would you ship can water ma- mail your you water there, right now. All of our guests via the phone line this morning are uh, Metropolitan Health Group. Um, She's got back from Colorado. Yes, <laughs> can't, can't travel water. <laughs> Metropolitan I know Health Group. You can and can't get through security. Real doctors, real solutions. Get in touch with Charlie Harvey and Jason Ramazan. Uh, in fact, Mr. Fun's Travel heading out west for the uh, the UCLA opener. Looking forward to uh, to heading out with uh, with that crew. For uh, for the opening game, LSU versus UCLA. As of now, all uh, all things go green lights. Go. Wow. We are uh, we are moving forward. Everything is uh, is going as scheduled. 
uh, up to this point. So hopefully it can stay like that. Seems like two weeks is too late to call it, right? Now we've oh. gotten to that two week mark. Like, it needs I, mean, to they would have, I don't trust anything during these times, yeah. man. They I mean, would you could be looking at a 24 hour window of getting on this plane. That's they might true, pull the plug. I guess. Yeah. They wouldn't do that, that would to suck. LSU. They yeah. would not know what they had. That, whatever that <laughs> national security threat level orange is, it bumps up a, a, a color grade in California. Uh, it bumps up to purple. Purple. Jeff is, uh, Jeff's asking for the site. It's gnosports.com. Yeah, I stuck it on there. Gno.com yeah. slash win. Oh, it's Gno Sports. I didn't put the sports in on there. Yes, think. Gno Sports. My bad. Gno Sports. And it's on our uh, social media. Um, so the Saints news, man. Um I, I really thought that somebody was messing with me when I saw this link yesterday. <laughs> I mean, I thought, there's no way, there's no way that that they're dealing with this, too. And then I look up, we, I, I was leaving a meeting, I look up, and, and Peyton is on the television explaining the meeting that he just had with Patrick Robinson. And Robinson, after 11 years, and the Saints make a move for him a couple of years back in free agency, is is retiring. He's stepping away from the game in the middle of training camp at a position that the Saints are overly stressed about going into the season. I mean, they, they need, forget bodies, they need players, they need guys, they need dudes. I mean, they're bringing in uh, Prince Amukamara. I mean, remember that guy? <laughs> that he was on the Eagles dream team. With whenever they had Michael Vick, Vince Young, and then Prince Amukamara, it was just, I mean... That was 10 years ago. Have you ever heard of Paulson Adebo? No. No, me either. Ken Crawley's back. Heard uh, of him. Brian Poole. You got Marshawn Lattimore there as the he's starter. I mean, Patrick to... Robinson was getting reps with the ones. He was going to be the second corner. Uh, and, and Marshawn Lattimore is going to have to sit the first four games or something from that suspension. He's going to get suspended for his, uh, yeah. his little trip to Ohio. So yeah. you've got not a, you won't have a name that you recognize out there on the when, on week one. What happened I mean, in his trip to Ohio? He had a gun. Uh. Illegally. Illegally. And um, he said it was registered to him and it wasn't. And stolen. Then, uh, so, yeah, I just it, yeah, pot and slid him a gun just in case. Good. You don't know yeah. where you're going to end up when you're with your homies from uh, <laughs> back in the day. It was, uh, yeah, not a good scene for Marshawn. No, and the cops, Obviously the cops was, was like, Marshawn, what are you doing? Yeah, right. like, I don't know. <laughs> Smells like a lot of marijuana well, in here. not going to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, right. Um... But yes, I mean, there's going to be some type of there's going to be some type of pushback on that. I mean, there's going to be some type of reprimand on on Lattimore, um, and he's going to miss time. David Onyemata is going to miss time. Six games suspended by the league for a PED failed test. Um, obviously, the stuff that you have going on now with Mike Thomas and the latest on Thomas is that he wants out. He he has told his agent to to start spreading the message that. He wants to be traded. I saw it wasn't exactly official yet, that there's a lot of conjecture out there that it's not officially official, but, um, I mean, obviously it's trending in that direction, but it's not officially reported. I saw it last night on Twitter. Um, but still, where there's smoke. Seems like it's trending, like in, that it's direction. trending yeah, in that it direction. Seems like it's very much trending in the direction of Mike Thomas uh, and his days in New Orleans being numbered. Um, and then you are in the middle of dealing with the Thomas saga where – I mean, Peyton's being asked about social media posts that Mike Thomas is making. And, you know, I mean, Peyton is not the one that you want to be asking about Twitter accounts and Facebook posts during press conferences. Within that same day, he's got to go back to the podium and explain how his number one cornerback or, you know, one A cornerback is, is retiring. After, after 11 seasons, and Patrick Robinson was drafted by the New Orleans Saints. He signed with Philadelphia in free agency a couple of years ago. He was a part of that Eagles winning Super Bowl team, and then he was brought back to New Orleans uh, by Mickey Loomis and Sean Payton in free agency two years ago. He's been banged up since he's been back down here uh, in, in New Orleans. Has never really made a real impact uh, at any point during his, his New Orleans. I mean, it seems like he's, he's, he's struggled in just a Saints uniform. He had a lot of success in Philadelphia where he really settled into becoming a, a, a really a good, I mean, nickel cornerback, uh, a nickelback for, uh, for Philadelphia and was a real big piece on that Super Bowl championship run. I, I want to say he had a big pick in the playoffs, big pick six uh, in, in, in that playoff run for, uh, 
uh, for for Philadelphia. I believe in the Minnesota game and the NFC Championship game. Uh, but now here in New Orleans, after a couple of seasons of being back down with the franchise, he's out. I mean, why is that? I mean, he said his heart wasn't in it, maybe. But like, what happens? Like, well, the, I think this is the time you decide to leave. Thirty-three years old, eleven years I in the league. I didn't realize he was that old. I know, I didn't either. Um, thirty-three years old and eleven years in the league. That. You speak to a lot of these veterans or a lot of these guys who have played at this level. Uh, when you get to that point, it's 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 tough, man. It's tough yeah. to it's tough to start the motor every day. It's tough to be gassed up and ready to go and be hyped up when you've got twenty three, twenty four, twenty five year olds who are you know very motivated, very hungry for for a contract, very hungry to prove who they are. Uh, and not saying that the Saints really have that at the cornerback position, but that's usually kind of the the life of a a veteran within the league. I mean, they um, hate this time of the year more than anything. And this time of the year, yes, absolutely. The training camp days for an NFL player, and just speaking to um, you know the guys that we've had access of playing in that league. I mean, this is. This is your worst, you know, these are the worst. This, this is, is when you retire. This is when you retire. When you yeah, look at I, mean, I don't want to do this bullshit. In fact, Sean, in, in fact, Sean Payton yesterday, when, when explaining Patrick Robinson, told the media, this happens a lot more than you would think. Uh, you would think. Like, a lot of the times, these veterans will come into a coach's office during, you know, the first or second week of training camp and say, you know what, man, I'm just, I'm tapped out. I'm just, I'm not in it. My body, my mind, I'm just not checked in. And, you know, football is a sport where, if you're not, if you're not engaged in it, I mean, you can get hurt yeah. real quick. You know what I mean? Like really hurt. Um, so I guess it was smart then on his part. If you get that inkling and you don't want to be out yeah. there anymore, there's no point in, in sticking around. You're not going to find that fire again. It's right. just it's one day you get out there, you're you're looking around, you're like, I don't know if I want to do this yeah. anymore. And once you have that feeling, it's probably time it's to walk be weird. away. Yeah. But um, I, I saw Sean Payton said he was smart and good, smart with his money, and so maybe this is just like the right time for him and. Right. Just like I mean, he said, he felt it in his heart. Yeah, it just seems like this was the right time to make this move. I mean, he, um, you know, you don't have a lot of access to him from a media standpoint, so you don't know where he's at, but just going by what Sean Payton said in the meeting that they have and the conversations that they had, he just, I mean, he was tapped out. He just, yeah. he was, he was out of it. And I don't know how, I, I don't know how you play that game if you're not. Engaged in it, I don't. One hundred percent. I mean, but he's definitely leaving the Saints a little high and dry here. Like, whew. not to. It's not his fault at all. But like, yeah. the Saints are just in a terrible spot right now. Yeah. And 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 that's where he comes back. If you trade Michael Thomas, there's whispers out there of maybe Urban's dabbling and wanting to bring him back. They won a national championship together. Jacksonville has a corner you could swap for. I would. I don't know what else you would get. It might be a one for one where you go from get C.J. Henderson, and at least it brings some stability to the defense side of the ball. You have Marshawn come back. You have a number two corner in C.J. Henderson. At least things look better on paper than they look right now. They feel very dysfunctional from the Saints organization. I mean, it feels very, um, not chaotic, but it just feels like, I mean, it's one thing after it's another. dominoes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it just, every day you look up, there's a lot of stories dealing with not football. You know what I mean? Like, there's not a lot of football stories coming out of Saints training camp. and Not a lot of good news. During this time, that's not good. You know what I mean? Like, there's really not too much else to talk about during this point other than who's getting reps, what do people look like, what's going on in the practice field, who's in shape, who's out of shape. Um, I, I just think that, um, man, that it's not a good, not good vibes no. around the Saints right now. That, I, and it makes you wonder if, if, if Drew Brees was the whole thing holding this thing together at some point wherever they were had so much – on the line every year to ride with Drew because they didn't know when he was really going to retire. And they're like, all right, we're holding this thing together, holding the boat, holding the rope, whatever you want to say, to get Drew to a championship, and they didn't do it. And now it's like, it feels like we're starting over on this thing. Like, you got a feel for Cam Jordan. He's, like, looking around like, man, we were so close four years in a row, and now it feels like we're restarting. So when you're a Patrick Robinson at 33, it's like, we're not going to be good. I signed up to be on a championship team. Like, I didn't sign up to be restarting at 33, so I might yeah. as well walk. When you look at, you know, some of the players around the league that play for the Saints, like Demario Davis, he signed up to be on a championship team, and they've all come so close. And now it feels like Michael Thomas is out. We don't know who the quarterback is. Patrick Robinson yeah, retires. Marshawn's not going to play. Our kicker's getting surgery on his groin. Like, everything, every little piece, that everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. 
And if you're a vet that wanted to get a chip, I'm out. Yeah, man. I mean, I didn't even mention the Will Lutz story. He was in surgery yesterday. I mean, Will Lutz is going to be out 12 weeks. Is there a scarier surgery than groin surgery? Uh, I wouldn't a imagine. A vasectomy? Yeah, maybe a vasectomy. Circumcision? Just very, it's a blade very close to, to anything. Uh, you babies. It's a, it's a blade Whatever. very close. close. Yeah. That's um, my knee. surgery. <laughs> Go Chevrolet. <laughs> G-E-A-U-X Chevrolet.com. Remember, you can find them online at Go Chevrolet. Uh, they're located in Laplace, Louisiana. If you're looking for a new car, if you're looking for a used car, get over to Go Express Auto Sales. Uh, that is on Florida Boulevard and Sherwood Forest. Uh, check them out. Fine sponsor here of the Jordy Collada Show. Been around since day one. Always grateful for, uh, for, for Lee Carney and Nick Richard. Uh, those guys have great automotive experience. Uh, they broke off doing their own thing with Go Chevrolet and having tremendous success. Go down and see them down in Laplace, Louisiana. Friendly in their service, uh, very uh, competitive prices, uh, and great selections. Uh, check them out online at Go Chevrolet, G E A U X, Chevrolet.com. Go Chevrolet is uh, one of the uh, proud supporters here uh, of the Jordy Colada. So see uh, Sage Ryan running uh, backup nickel right now to Cardell Flott, one of the prize recruits of LSU's 2021 class. Uh, out of Lafayette, Ryan came in as the number one safety in the country, right? Um, him and uh, Derek Davis in this class. Davis out of Pennsylvania was rated the number three safety uh, in the class as LSU was able to nab two out of the top three safeties in this recruiting cycle. And then Matthew Langwa added to the mix, but it seems like they are trying to find a path to the field for Sage Ryan here pretty quick. Um, and, and that's one of the things that's starting to jump out here at this point in training camp, right? The guys that are starting to shuffle up some of, some of the, 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 the players that are coming back and some of the positions where you thought that you were, you may have been solid or you had some light competition like this nickel position. I mean, Cardell Flott's the guy, right? But I, I think that Cardell Flott um, was, was really kind of one of the only ones at that position that you thought was going to be consistent there. Now, I mean, the early training, cross-training of a guy like Sage Ryan shows you uh, that they got to get him on the field. It also shows me uh, that they like where they are at safety. Seems like Major Burns is making play after play, day after day uh, back there. It was Ogeron last week at the Rotary Club the day before they reported for training camp and saying that if they had to uh, name a starter today at safety, it would be Major Burns. And that, I think, you know, in a room... Uh, full of supporters and media members, that was kind of uh, a moment where people were kind of looking around like, hmm, uh, okay. I mean, that was uh, a position where you, you know, you got Todd Harris uh, back there. You got some veterans that you trust. Jay Ward was a guy that they've been really high on, that they changed positions on, that I think ultimately is going to play a ton of football for LSU this season. Uh, but to hear Major Burns, a guy that they get out of the transfer portal, uh, to make that much of an instant impact, uh, in just a couple of days on campus um, and, and, and being, you know, uh, the starter going into camp from Ogeron's eyes and point of view uh, is a very strong testament for that position that was once considered very much a, a, a position Question of worry, you know, I mean, a position of concern. And if you can take the number one safety in the country and get him on the field as a nickelback as a freshman – that's a you know that tells me you got some you, you feel like you've got some stability on the back end. I mean that really gives um, a lot of confidence to to that defensive backfield. I mean you know what you've got in Ricks, you know what you got in Stingley. You got the best two cornerbacks, the best tandem of cornerbacks in college football. If you can get quality safety play, and you know the the news of Sage Ryan to me being you know bumped down bumped down at safety but bumped up the chart at, at a nickelback where they can get him on the field a little earlier tells you that, hey, look, you don't have to play Ryan early. You don't have to play him quick. You don't have to get on the field at safety and save you back there. But you do want to get him on the field. Where can you get him on the field? Um, so do you have Major Burns and Jay Ward as your two starting safeties? At this point, I do. I mean, I think that Todd Harris is definitely going to have something to say about it uh, just because of how much football he's played. Smart guy. I mean, smart player. Um, and, and he should be ready to go. But it seems like, yeah, Jay Ward and – which I love. Two veteran guys. Two older guys. Experienced guys um, back there. And then you can, you know, you can kind of pepper in 
um, you know, guys like Matthew Langlois, Derek Davis, Sage Ryan. Um, I mean, this defensive backfield now. I mean, you're talking about a lot, a lot of good players adding quality depth to where you're building. I mean, you've almost got two, three deep at every position. I mean, think about the levels of this defense, the front line, the names that you can just rattle off. Joe Evans, Glenn Logan, Jaqueline Roy, Jacoby and Guillory. Um, Neil you know, Farrell. Uh, Neil Farrell. Um, Is it Farrell? I don't know. <laughs> you say Farrell, I'll say Farrell. Farrell. Just make sure we get it right. <laughs> you know what I mean? We'll take Katie's approach. Big Neil. Yeah, right. Uh, B.J. O'Jolary. Taysom Winston. Um, <laughs> For all. But, I mean, the names. Yes, O'Jolary, uh, Savion Jones, um, Ali Gay. Go to the linebacker spot. Micah Baskerville, Bug Strong, Mike Jones, Damone Clark, um, the third level. I mean, you, we just rattled off those names. I mean, they've got names and guys that you can really, really trust and put out there and play with some depth. And to me, that has been the difference between the Alabamas, the Georgias, and LSU being there consistently has been the line play, is, has been the line of scrimmage, where, where those teams have depth and, and LSU's been trying to stack it. LSU's got it now, on, especially on the defensive side. They still need it on the offensive line, and they're looking for it at some playmaking positions, which they have it on campus. they just got to build it. Um, but, I mean, that's why I believe LSU is a championship contending team this year because when you look at their defense, their defense is championship good. I mean, they are – they're deep. They're talented. They've got pros. At all levels, they've got NFL players at every single level of LSU's defense. Allie Gay is going to be a first-round pick. B.J. Ujolari could be a top-ten pick in two years. Jaqueline Roy, potentially, could be a high-end draft pick for LSU. Joseph Evans is a guy that I think a lot of NFL scouts are starting to pay attention to and ask questions about. At the linebacking position, Mike Jones is a pro. Bug Strong, potentially, could be a pro. Micah Baskerville potentially, could be a pro. And then the third level, you may have the number one pick in the draft when you have Stingley. If he's not number one, he's number two. If he's not number two, he's definitely number three. <laughs> Eli Ricks is a top ten pick two years from now at cornerback. And then when you look at the safeties, I mean, some of these guys that are starting to play and starting to pop back there are going to be playing on Sundays. I mean, they've got pros at every single level of LSU's defense going into the season. And that's why, in my opinion, people look at LSU and they are a little nervous about them. And I know we talked about the, the USA Today top 25 coming out. LSU ranked 13th, which, in my opinion, is a beautiful starting spot. Yeah. It's just good enough where you're at the party, but you're a little far away from the dance floor where you're motivated to get there. Right, and you can find them. But a guy like Ed Ogeron, to me, sitting at thirteen, Thrives. that is his. You couldn't hand pick a better starting spot for an Ed Ogeron kind of down in the dumps team, a team that has some question marks, has some questions about the stability of the head coach and what's going to kind of be his his lifeline at LSU. What's it going to look like? Um, See, I've been such an anti proponent of the USA Today polls and everything too. that come with it because it almost like you start off teams that they, they put so much – you say there's no stock in it, and I say there's a ton of stock in it. Alabama starts off as one. Clemson they starts off do. as two. Right. <laughs> but when, when they lose a the game, they don't get bumped down very far because, oh, they're the number one team in the country. Right. It's like, well, you said none of this is supposed to matter. But then when you start the, you start the season and they pretend like they, you know, they rank them eight games in or whatever, like they come back and re-rank them, everybody looks at these polls and they say, well, they're the, you know, they're the, third, the third best team in the country, the fourth best team in the country. So when they lose early, they don't get dinged nearly as hard. And it just kind of sets people up to be – it sets you up for failure and then to be able to succeed later on because Clemson is allowed to lose early because they're seen as a top five team in the country. So when they lose, they get dinged, right? You drop them down to five, drop them down to six. Yeah, but if Clemson gets beat early on in the, in the season, they're getting beat by number five, Georgia. Right, but it should just be, it should just be like, all right, we think all of these teams are good. 
I shouldn't put a number next to it because it skews people's opinions in my mind. Well, I, look, man, I, 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 I agree with you. I think that you should go into the season as just throw them against the wall, and then in the middle of the year, then we rate them. Yeah. But well, that's he, what they do, but then you can't do the preseason polls either. But then the people mm-hmm. are trying to sell magazines and trying to get clicks, and that's what really stirs all of this stuff. People are just wanting to talk about it. Yeah, people are just are. wanting to. USA Today is going to see a, a huge amount of clicks to, today on their internet, on, on, on their website, right? Because people are going to go to that, that website and want to see where their team is, why they're ranked there, what they say about their team at 13, and, you know, they can take that to advertisers and sell space on it. I mean, that's ultimately why this happens. But the effect that it has on the game, I understand. But, I mean, really, are we going to argue? Are there three or four better rosters than Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, and Oklahoma? No, but I want to see it. Yeah, I want to see it. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but at the end of the season, I want to see Alabama and Georgia playing. Well, then they'll be I want to see LSU playing, you know, Oklahoma. I mean, I want to see the best teams playing. And usually... It works itself out. It kind of, it kind of, you know, kind of plink, plinkos itself there. <laughs> you know what I mean? These are so overrated. Like Notre Dame, isn't that kind of overrated to be where they are? See, those oh. are the teams that get to sneak in. Like, where, yeah. do, where do they put them? Eight, six? Seven. See? And it's like, we well, yeah, haven't done anything to be there. Right, They're, that's the thing. Like, that one seems weird. A&M seems kind of weird to me, too. Because that's well, a little overrated, right? I, After, I think that they're, uh, out of the top ten, the top ten, and real quick, the one through five, Alabama one, Clemson two, Oklahoma three, Ohio State four, Georgia five. So that's the top five. Six through ten, Texas A&M, Notre Dame, Iowa State, North Carolina, and Cincinnati. Yeah, those are weird to me. Six through ten. They had good but years last year. They had, they had, good, they had good years last year. You look but at that's North, not this year. You, you look at North Carolina, but that's a lot what this stuff is. Yeah. You look at North Carolina – They've got what is believed to be going into the season, if not the top quarterback in college football, one of the top quarterbacks. We're not buying. I don't buy it. I'm out on Sam uh, Howell. Me too. Mm-hmm. I'm not buying Sam Howell. He looks um, like Mitchell Trubisky wrapped yeah, I mean, up in I mean, an I mean, extra. He looks like, like a single tie, bro. Yeah. I mean, he looks like a <laughs> flat football quarterback. I mean, he looks like an LSU baseball player a couple of years back. <laughs> He's looking I mean? for a cigarette. Yeah, right. <laughs> what about um, the Cajuns being on there, though? I love it. I love it. And that was surprising to me. Was it to y'all? No. I it mean, wasn't? is there more of a successful program over the last three years in college football it's than UL? Program. I mean, I, I would I would say that the 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 the, the comped success to that would be the big boys. I mean, they have been consistent. They have they have scheduled. They have played anybody and in in anywhere, um, and they hadn't lost a lot. Mm. You know, I mean, they've been really good. And Billy Napier has has built a program down in Lafayette where you know a couple of uh, of years ago, you were celebrating them being in the top 25. I mean, that was kind of like what you were the first time ever. Now it's you, you look up, and it would be weird to see their name not next to a number. 10-1 last year. Yeah. I mean. 28-11 under Napier. Wow. That's, 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 that's strong, strong coach. That's strong. I, mean, that, I don't care where you're at. I don't care what level of football you're coaching. To, what, to do what they've accomplished on his watch while he's been there. Is is impressive. It's very impressive. So to to look up and see them twenty third in the country going into the season, and, and what's not, and, and what's even more not as big of a surprise is that Louisiana, the Raging Cages are at twenty three. At twenty four is Coastal Carolina. Yeah, you know that's what I mean. Who, that's who. That's the only team you I mean, lost like, to. Like like who. <laughs> Who would have uh, have guessed two years ago? Chanticleers. That, that Chanticleers. Coastal Ca- Coastal Carolina is a regular player in the top twenty-five of college football. So, you know, what I mean, for every argument that you get, you get um, you know a, a team like the, the Cajuns and Coastal Carolina getting in there and, and, and experiencing it. But I mean, the, the the preseason stuff is is for nothing but for us. Yeah. I mean, really, just fodder. Yeah. I mean, it's just for us to go back and forth and. And, and talk about it and kick it around and uh, be able to discuss what we agree with and what we disagree with. I thought Georgia would be higher, honestly. <clears throat> I thought they would be like three. I, I, you know what? I, I agree with you, um, especially when you look at the makeup of their roster and when you think about just kind of a, a balanced mm-hmm. roster. I mean, Georgia's got everything. They I mean, really the question do. marks about Georgia are their wide receivers. You know what I mean? Like, they've got – Think about some of the recruits. I mean, the cat that they stole from LSU. Arik Gilbert? No, not uh, that, that, another one, Arik <laughs> Gilbert. But they had uh, 
Jermaine, um, the kid from California that went over there that was a freshman last year. Um, and he was committed Blanky. He was committed to LSU uh, for, for such a long time. I usually keep my spike list um, pretty in hand. <laughs> but if you woke up, like if you were in a coma for five years. And you, Bunker, help me out. If you woke up in a coma, I feel like you could pick the top four. Yes. Like, you could just wake up and be like, I bet it's Alabama, Ohio State, yes, Clemson, and absolutely. then insert fourth team. You could just throw something at the wall. Jermaine Burton. Burton. Wrong. Ah, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Um, He's their number one. Yeah, well, now he is. Now that Pickens mm-hmm. is down. Um, Ole Miss, 25 on the list. It's like a little shade there. I feel like they would have been a touch higher. Um, really? See the SEC teams here uh, outside of Ole Miss. Ole Miss is 25. The top 10 is riddled with SEC teams, as we told you. Alabama's one. Uh, Georgia is five. Texas A&M is six. To me, A&M at six is... Uh, it's a lot of respect this for Jimbo. Is their, this is their is. first invitation to the of, party. A lot of respect for Jimbo, it replacing is. a quarterback. Um, so uh, Texas A&M at six. Uh, and then uh, outside of the top ten, Florida's 11. LSU's 13. And then Ole Miss is 25. So the, uh, that, is, that, that is the top 25 according to the USA Today coaches poll that was published yesterday. Daily, we are brought to you over here on the uh, on the Jordy Collada show by Falaya Real Estate. Remember, you can get in touch with Barrett Blondo and his crew over at Falaya Real Estate just by calling him today at 225-939-6153. If you're looking to sell your house and you're thinking about trying for sale by owner, then you need to check out Falaya. Their listing plans start at 399 bucks. You can sell your house by yourself. Save thousands with Falaya. For more information, visit falaya.com or download the Falaya app inside your Apple Store or your Google Play Store, falaya.com. If you want to save some cash, then you need to check out Falaya Real Estate. Uh, give us a little bit to reset. We'll talk to uh, Chef Jean-Paul Bourgeois coming up here at 8 a.m. We will uh, reset the LSU football conversation. Hopefully, Rohan Davey will be here at 8.30 this morning. Then we'll talk to uh, Nick Underhill over at New Orleans.Football about this Saints situation and just what mm. is the latest, what's his point of view, He's a great Saints insider, just kind of getting the feeling around the building of where they are here early on in training camp, where a lot of the stories, the majority of the stories, have dealt with everything that is not football. I mean, the Mike Thomas situation is off the field. Will Lutz is going to have surgery. He's going to miss 12 weeks. David Onyemata is going to be suspended for the first six games of the season because of a PED failed test. Marshawn Lattimore has is, is got some type of punishment, you would think, coming down from the NFL after his offseason troubles. Uh, and then Patrick Robinson yesterday announcing his retirement after 11 seasons in the league and just a couple of years back with the Saints in free agency uh, and now deciding to walk away from the game uh, at 33 years old. We'll ask Nick Underhill how all of these stories affect the black and gold as they prepare for preseason game number one coming up this weekend uh, for New Orleans as we will talk to Underhill an hour from now. He'll be here at 845 this morning. Uh, you're watching the Jordy Collada Show, daily driven and powered by Go Chevrolet. Papa Earl's, the fine spice, originating right down here in South Louisiana by our guy Mark Pop Norman. Developed it back in 2018 and won Amazon's Newcomer of the Year in 2019. They pride themselves in having 30% less salt and sodium than the leading brands at the same price point. You can find them locally. Look for Papa Earl's at Rouse's, Calandro's, Mathern's, High Neighbor, and more. True blue water. True hydration at its finest. Right now, you're only a few minutes away from getting your five-gallon water delivered to you, just like we are over here at the UDL. All you got to do is log on to truebluewater.com. That's T R U. BlueWater.com. The website's fantastic over at TrueBlueWater.com. You can get your service and find out how quick it is. You can schedule a delivery, even hop on the billing system right there at TrueBlueWater.com. T-R-U, BlueWater.com.
Go Chevrolet is proud to announce Go Express Auto Sales, the new used car lot located in the capital city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at 11522 Florida Boulevard. Go Express Auto Sales is online at goexpressautosales.com or you can search them on Facebook and social media at Go Express Auto Sales, the newest addition to the family of Go Chevrolet. Remember, Go Chevrolet is located down in Laplace, Louisiana, but now welcoming aboard Go Express, the new used car lot located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at 11522 Florida Boulevard. Gearing up for spring and summer down here in South Louisiana and you want to keep your lawn maintained during these sunny seasons, get in touch with our friend Blake Bear over at Bear's Lawn Maintenance where he says, you grow it, I mow it. 225-485-8022, 225-485-8022 is where you can find Bear's Lawn and Maintenance, the official lawn and maintenance company of the undisclosed location. A Bears Specialty Meats, home to the finest boudin in South Louisiana. Two spots right here in Baton Rouge and out in Prairieville. Stop in and see them in the Dutchtown Shopping Center on Highway 73 or right here in Baton Rouge on Jefferson Highway. Online, abearsmarkets.com, and they're all over social media. You can find them on Facebook. You can find them on Instagram. A Bears combines perfect seasoning with that authentic Cajun flavor. Find out for yourself. Baton Rouge on Jefferson Highway and in Prairieville on Highway 73. abearsmarkets.com. GoFlow IV and Spa, 7970 Jefferson Highway is where you can find them or you can simply go online to GoFlowIV.com. GoFlow IV Spa is a medical spa that specializes in IV hydration with vitamin infusion. At GoFlow IV Spa, they can help you with a wide range of issues from skin care to illness recovery, athletic performance, hangover cure, chronic illness, and even chronic dehydration. GoFlowIV.com or stop in and see them. 7970 Jefferson Highway. Two great watches last night on television. Ooh, yeah. I was all I only in, got one of them. I was then. all enthralled, man. Me too. Stayed I, up late. I love premium like sports television. I wish y'all could have watched it better. with me because it has to be like taking a kid to Disney World for the first time and watching them like see Vicky. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. And David was like, how did you not see this when it was happening? And I was like, I didn't. That wasn't my world. Like, but oh my god! He's like, yeah, unbelievable. Um, <laughs> put Jay down last night. Put him to sleep. Kelly was it was was tired. She was she was knocked out oh, early. Perfect scenario. Then. It was. I was <laughs> kind of like, wow, That's this kind of worked out a, incredibly. A hand in the pants. Like yeah. I get to watch this with the <laughs> yeah. remote in my yes. hand. Like hell yes. Wow. We're like, talking about Malice like, in the Palace. Yes. By the way, for and Hard Knocks. Uh, we, yes, I watched both of them I last didn't do night. Hard Double knocks. feature. I, I, I doubled up, man. I stayed in the. Theater. Uh, just yes, for that movie absolutely. To roll again. Don't blow that one. For me. Uh, which one? Hard knock. Uh, hard knock. Whatever, dude. Get yeah. with it or get Catch lost. Up, I got some thoughts. Every on the hard Tuesday knocks. night. Um, I watched the Mouse in the Palace. Give me some credit. That was. That was amazing. I forgot how good the Pacers were. Like I didn't they know. Were, they were amazing. They were championship <laughs> level good. And they wouldn't let you forget about it. No. They were like we were going to win the chip. Yeah. But what did you notice? They were. Yeah. Did you notice the first like the first thing I noticed when they did the uh, 
the, they went to the playoff game was the final score was like 62 58 yes, and i was I like did notice how that. did we watch this basketball like, but, what were we watching but then it makes me like want it back because they were fouling the shit out of each other like they're no easy buckets dude. yeah but that that call on our test the one that he got that was such so, a bullshit call i think yeah. the refs got a little like, into the moment there. even in 2004 like i mean it was much more of a physical. That to me was much more aimed at our test Without than it doubt. was the league. I mean, yeah. because, and he was retaliating. And I know you always catch the second guy, but what? Who? Who, who was it? It that, was Rip Hamilton. It was it, like I mean, that Rip slammed. Yeah, he slammed into him, and our test was just kind of like. Just putting it up, just kind of letting you know, man. Well, that's how good of a defender Ron Artest was. He knew exactly where he was going, and he just like, I bet he's about to turn right right here and just like, boop, put my he arm up. And it was, oh, he was a hound. Unbelievable. Oof, but when he was right, like he, when he was on, like man. that, that the, the night of the the, the 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 malice. I mean, he was the best player on the floor. And he was unhinged. And he said he was in a terrible mental state. Yeah, yeah it was but like, dude, that ball so rolls good. out. We're good. Right. I, did y'all yep, think Jermaine O'Neal was so different, like, now? Like, he was right. so it chill, low-key, like, just... It wrecked him. Yeah, it ruined, it ruined he's like his a career. different man. It wrecked him. They were so good. We talked about this yesterday a little bit, it, defensively, inside huh. and out. Like, and they they, had, the be- it, they yeah. had the best post defender in the league, and they had the best perimeter defender in the league. I mean, Jermaine O'Neal was the best post defender, and Artest was probably the best defensive player in basketball. Yeah, had um, to be. And when, when Jamal Tinsley started the whole thing, yeah, he started the whole thing. He should. I mean, he got into our test ear and told him, "Now's the time to get your foul." Your one foul. Like, Why'd you tell that to Ron? I mean, yeah, yeah they were <laughs> like, ain't right already. <laughs> Steven Jackson, <laughs> so give him funny. No excuses. <laughs> Steven Jackson. <laughs> Who the bleep don't know Reggie Miller plays for the Indiana that was Pacers? So awesome. I ain't talking about this bullshit yeah, no more. He was it. wearing a suit. That's so? so good. Yeah, so <laughs> good. It's Reggie Miller. Who Reggie Miller is. That thing got out of hand so quickly. It did. But I man. loved our test sitting in his living room with his socks and the socks. And, and the rec league basketball. He's I so mean, comfortable, bro. He's so comfortable now. Wait, why is he met a world piece? When because he just that went happen? he went Buddhist, things, man, and he was like, I gotta find my center, and that's what he said when he laid down okay. on the scores table. Which all time moment. I forgot that it looked like that, where he's people are pushing and shoving, and he has his hands crossed. He just looks like, like this. such an asshole. Oh, but he was I like, know. My therapist told me to count to five. To count and that's to five. I'm doing. just chilling over here. He's like, chilling. I know Jermaine ain't gonna let Ben touch me, and I got Steven Jackson's crazy ass out there. <laughs> I love when he was talking about Jermaine. He's like, Jermaine's crazy. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> he put a he got one. it just like me. <laughs> he put a nice little blanket over that, but yeah, he's crazy like I yeah, am. He's like, he's crazy just like me. Uh, uh, and then you put they put a bow on it with the Stephen Jackson story. Ron, you think we'll get in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable, man. Ron, and Ron's don't like, think we're gonna be in trouble. trouble. <laughs> Ron, Ron, our career is over. Bro. We might get kicked out the league. We might get thrown out the league. <laughs> and then he goes, "Oh shit, Jermaine's gonna come whip my ass." <laughs> and he, he almost did. did. He almost did. That's unbelievable. He almost did. The ending, just when the palace falls. I mean, that was pretty legit ending. Yeah. See, that was it. I feel like, I don't know if we're... First off, those fans still deserve to have their ass kicked. Yes. For the ones that believe that they were, like, wrong that night. And they for, do believe it. Yeah, they, 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 like, they, like, Jermaine O'Neal took a sucker punch at me. Are you out of your <laughs> mind, bro? When you walk down onto that floor, it's like walking into somebody's office and threatening them. Yes. What do you expect them to do? The fact that, and Reggie Miller, I thought that was a line of the night. If you haven't seen it, go to Netflix and watch The Palace and the Malice. It's so good. Uh, the, Malice the Malice and the, the Palace, Palace. So good. documentary. It is fantastic. It's Just part the, of the, the, the backstories. Series. The backstories that you learned. Yes. Like along the way. But I mean, Reggie Miller says it best. That fan better thank God every single night that Jermaine O'Neal slipped on whatever he slipped and just hit him, brushed him across the chin. Because if he catches, not if he catches him full on, if he catches him three quarters on, he kills him. He kills the guy. Literally. I mean, seven foot, pissed off, coming downhill at you, trying to hit you. If he connects with you, He's going to kill you. You know what he slipped in? That guy's pee. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, and for that guy still to be thinking yes. that he was wrong and that Jermaine O'Neal took a cheap shot at him. Bro, get off the camera, man. That, that get out of here. Well, the be- and the guy that threw the beer. 
still deserves to be in jail. He does. Like, like, he's still, like, trolling and making jokes. Like, still. Bruh. What a piece of shit. I'm telling you, what a piece of shit. And like, Jermaine he, O'Neal said he went home and watched that over and over, and everybody's calling him a thug and a hooligan, and the fans are just getting away with it. That was another David part. Stern skated. Yes. David oh, Stern skated. God. But the media and the use of the, the yes. T-word yes. was yes. just <laughs> random. Was Bob Costa said yeah. it. Uh, uh, Stephen A. Smith. And, uh, they were just out there. I was like, what are they doing? I mean. Because that's a word that you just don't use anymore. And they were just, that was the. That was awful. These people I, get, forgot, I forgot the dress code. Yeah. Came, immediate. Right. Just like that. And, um, and if you could read, like, the newspaper articles, like, the players are going to be pissed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah. They're like, guess what? We're going to make it real cool. So everything changed after that moment. Everything. Huh? Everything. Basketball I mean, kind of changed. It did. Mm -hmm. They started calling more. Like, the fouls got a lot. It did. They got, started calling a lot earlier. They started managing the game before it could get it to that did. point. But, but looking back on that, to paint our test, O'Neal, Jackson, in the wrong... I mean, it's those fans that are interviewed, and I don't want to give you the entire story if you haven't seen it, but, I mean, they still believe that they were right. Like, like that they were now, – now, now, look, man, the scene on the court was, was bad. But, I mean, we've all been to sporting events where there's been back and forth between the players and even some pushing and shoving and some, some going back and forth. I mean, Ben Wallace was – he was pissed. I mean, Ben Wallace was pissed. Ben Wallace. None of them should have been out there. I mean, Ben Wallace's voice. Ben oh Wallace's voice God. and it's... Ben Wallace checking you, like walking you down oh. and shoving you in. Like that showed how strong our test was. I mean, yeah. he checks – our test, full on, like walking that and check. It pushes him like up in here, like up in his neck. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And our test takes, it takes it. like two steps. Like it takes two steps back and comes back like. I'm telling you, bro. Our test in 04, 05, 06 was that bad, man. He was a bad Wrong dude. Wrong crazy. He was bad. He was. Even the highlights in that game before the fight, you're like, look at this guy, bro. Unbelievable. I didn't, he's just like. He's just like jumping. I didn't know he could score it like that because when I think Me of Ron either. Artest, I remember him as like a wing defender for the Lakers. Like Me that's either. like my I'm first thought. Yes. But then you remember, I remember those Pacers teams because I remember when they traded for Steven Jackson. And I was like, oh, Watch this is going to get interesting. Hey, let me take this call, call and set up uh, Chef and we'll be right back here on the Jordy Collada Show presented by Go Chevrolet. Papa Earl's, the fine spice. Originating right down here in South Louisiana by our guy Mark Pop Norman. Developed it back in 2018 and won Amazon's Newcomer of the Year in 2019. They pride themselves in having 30% less salt and sodium than the leading brands at the same price point. You can find them locally. Look for Papa Earl's at Rouse's, Calandro's, Matherne's, High Neighbor, and more. Go Chevrolet is proud to announce Go Express Auto Sales, the new used car lot located in the capital city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at 11522 Florida Boulevard. Go Express Auto Sales is online at goexpressautosales.com or you can search them on Facebook and social media at Go Express Auto Sales, the newest addition to the family of Go Chevrolet. Remember, Go Chevrolet is located down in Laplace, Louisiana, but now welcoming aboard Go Express, the new used car lot located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at 11522 Florida Boulevard. Gearing up for spring and summer down here in South Louisiana and you want to keep your lawn maintained during these sunny seasons, get in touch with our friend Blake Bear over at Bear's Lawn Maintenance where he says, you grow it, I mow it. 225-485-8022. 225-485-8022 is where you can find A Bears Lawn and Maintenance, the official lawn and maintenance company of the undisclosed location.
Welcome back here to the Jordy Collada Show, driven and powered by Go Chevrolet and brought to you every day by Bear Specialty Meats. Remember, Bears is located in Baton Rouge and in Prairieville, Highway 73, right there next to Dutchtown High School. Great selections in the freezer. Great boudin. Go in, pick up one today. Tell them you heard it right here on the Jordy Collada Show. Tell them you heard it during Chef Jean-Paul Bourgeois segment as we have every Wednesday here with us. He is back and getting ready for football season back in the States. Mm. Yes, <laughs> I can hear yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard, <laughs> Chef. Good morning. How are you? Team, team. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody good. is doing Excellent. good. It's good to have you back. Football season, it kind of feels like it. Does it feel like it in your kitchen? Uh, it is not, right? Currently, I am sitting outside in Houston, Texas, and it's humid as heck. And uh, it is not. I haven't felt that, that cool little breeze come through yet, which uh, kind of gives me that Oh, wait, fall is actually coming. But uh, it's, you know, in the kitchen, I'm whipping up some chilies every now and then in the last couple weeks and some more heartier meals kind of just to test out those fall recipes coming up, you know? Chef, uh, football and food kind of go hand in hand, at least from the the, the sports viewer's standpoint. How about from the the chef's side, from from your side, somebody who your, your first passion is food? Where does sports fit in? You know, sports sports are pretty high up there. I mean, I, I may have mentioned this before, but I grew up in a like a long lineage of LSU uh, grads and families, and like all the way dating back into the fifties and to the Billy Cannon eras and stuff like that. And my papa played football at LSU with, during those times. So, you know, I was always felt like I was really, um, really involved in LSU, like athletics coming up, especially, you know, in the nineties and the Skip Bertman days. And I was playing little league baseball and that was like, you know, the, the dynasty of LSU baseball back then. So, um, but I didn't graduate from LSU and, um, but I always went to the game. So there's always been like a huge part of my life. You know, admittedly, I've probably fallen off of following along as much as I used to, um, from just moving around and being disconnected from, um, the, the, you know, Louisiana, a lot, a lot of those times, but I'm starting to get back in it for sure. And I've kind of been following along. Y- y'all are a lot of the source of my LSU news, to be honest. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of where I stand right now. Love to hear that. Okay. Let's get some questions going. Jeff wants to know what's your favorite brine recipe. Ooh. Brine yeah. recipe. Is that what, he, that was what he said? Yeah. Brine. Man, I, yeah, I like um, I like using ham brines, um, and so really the thing with ham brines is they'll have some pink salt in it or nitrates, which is which is what a lot of people use to cure different pork and beef and other red meats. I also will use it for fish and seafood if I'm using it as a brine, but I actually like love making. Um, Love, love using that, yeah. Love making that style of brine with, you know, it's got brown sugar, pink salt, peppercorns, garlic, bay leaf, um, salt, obviously, and then water, and then then adding the smoke to it after that, and that can be applied to not just ham, but most beef cuts, chicken cuts. Um, I've even done it with uh, like king mackerel um, and made mackerel ham. Um, of course, if you have duck breast or goose breast, or uh, they make great hams as well. And so I do like a ham brine. Chef, I have a serious question. I'm starting to realize how old I'm getting, and the first thing on that list is heartburn. What is the, what is the remedy, or how do I avoid it? Mm. Um, I hear you. I feel it too, man. Uh, I mean, for me, yeah, like I just try not to eat as late. You know what I mean? Like give yourself. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is. Post 9 p.m.? Yes. Yeah, bro. Yeah. yeah. And no, so. It's like 12 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I eat it like six. I eat it like six in the evening, yeah. you know, maybe even earlier sometimes. And because I like eating spiced foods and curries and different things from all over the world, that'll give you a bad heartburn. I need that time up, time upright, so I can let all that food digest and acid settle down back in myself before I go before I go horizontal. You know, He's so right. you exactly got to get right. you got to get your earlier dinner, man. You don't have right. to cut out all the foods necessarily. Just let that stuff settle for go, four man. hours before you get to bed. Well, there's another dilemma. I eat at lunch at like two thirty. 
So I'm mm. not hungry again until nine. And mm. I'm not necessarily even hungry. I just want to eat something because I enjoy it. So I'm like, well, one nice little treat before bed. So do I have to just, do yeah. I skip lunch? You're going to wake up at 30 and wait 260. I know, man. I'm worried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do intermittent. I do intermittent fasting. So I won't eat till around 1130. Uh, and I, I put pretty, basically put all my food mm. between 11, 1130 and six to seven. That's so all my calories are consumed then. And I, that helps me really stay on a schedule. Um, I'm mostly coffee and water till 11 uh, o'clock. How's your energy in the morning, Chef? Oh, great, man. My energy is great in the morning. I actually, um, I, I, in fact, that's the thing I find that interme- intermittent fasting helps me with the most. Me too. I am more locked in on work and my, my, I have no brain fog and I'm very, mm. um, I'm very sharp when I, so I, I put all my most important meetings and important conversations and recipe writing all before lunch because once I hit lunch, I'm like, all right, like I'm full, you know, I might want to take a nap, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and then getting some exercise in the morning helps with all that, keeping your, keeping all those, you know, that electricity going in your brain. That really helps me like when I have important things to do, I always schedule them before my first meal. So when's your last meal? Around seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. So no, yeah. like toddies after. Is that out the window? No, man. No, not really. Um, you know, I, I don't mind a cocktail or a glass of wine, but I usually I usually drink a cocktail before dinner, and then if I'm going to have a glass of wine, I'll have it with. But you know, to be honest with you, um, I'm just. I know it sounds boring. I'm just not a big drinker. Yeah. You know, a couple something before dinner, maybe with it. You know, when I'm hanging out with the boys at the Duck Ham, it's a different story, but. As a uh, for most days, I'm I'm mostly water. Um, that's the liquid of choice for me. Like uh, Chef, golly, keeps you, me keeps, you fit in, keeps me full you after fit seven in o'clock. So well too. around the Jordy Colada show, you don't <laughs> even know it. You, you don't even know it. Uh, <laughs> Chef Jean Paul Bourgeois joining us here, just like he does every Wednesday, a part of the Meat Eaters now on YouTube. As uh, as you can find him there, great new updated episodes for you, uh, Chef. I think I told you last week we went down to the uh, to South Louisiana down to Port Fouchon. And uh, mm, cleaned yeah. up on the specs, caught a couple of redfish. Then when we got back to the mainland, uh, we decided to fry up the specs. I noticed that everybody's got a different recipe when I started to ask around on just mm-hmm, the basic mm-hmm. fish fry prep work. How do I do this? I went with the mustard base and just went with the Louisiana fish fry. Dropped some of your spiceology in there uh, and, and just threw it on, on the, uh, in the fryer. Uh, do you have a go-to? On, on a fish fry method? Um, you know, I wouldn't say I have a go-to. I have a, some specific ingredients that I like, and I like the yellow. I mm-hmm. like the mustard kind of like little um, adhesive as well. I like to mix mustard and hot sauce in okay. mine, um, okay. Okay. and a lot of and a, and a fair amount of black pepper. That's kind of my kind of go-to little thing. As far as a fish fry goes, you know, as long as it's, it's seasoned well, um, I'll – I don't have a problem with it. My parents typically like just using corn flour, um, which is unseasoned fish fry essentially. And then I have to go ahead and season it all up. And that's pretty good too. But the most important thing for me is when I'm frying food, if I can use peanut oil, I'm going to always, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to use. Okay. So, um, you know, I think for me that, that really, a lot of folks are going to be frying fish the same way. They may tweak here and there and so on. Um, you know, from what you were just telling me, but a lot of people don't use peanut oil, and it is more expensive, uh, but it is reusable, too. So if you're frying fish once a week, you can fry, you know, fresh batch of speckled trout or redfish or whatever you have, catfish, let it cool, strain it out, and then reuse it, uh, you know, for another week or two. And um, peanut oil is just so tasty and just has a good high heat, high smoke point, so you can really get the fish up there and get a good flash fry. And has a nice, you know, clean flavor, but adds a little bit of like that nuttiness quality that you won't get out of canolas or vegetables, vegetable oils. What are you looking for in the fry? What is there? Is there a key point that you're looking for to pull it? Yeah, like I happen. So I think the coarser, the coarser grind, the coarser your cornmeal is, the more likelihood you are to have it turn that kind of like dark dark golden right. which i don't really like i want to keep it nice and bright and yellow which is yeah. why i like corn flour and so i like to cut my fish on the smaller side so 
so they take less time to fry. And I like to get my grease up to around 425 uh, with peanut oil and then just really give it a good, like a true flash fry yeah. with smaller cuts of fish so they cook thoroughly. But I can keep that cornmeal nice and golden mm. and really quick on the fry. Like fish nuggets. <laughs> like more like strips, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, more like strips. Now, I do, there's nothing wrong like with a – you know, with a speckled trout that's just over the limit. What's the what's the size limit on them? I forget. Like Tw- uh, twelve inches. Twelve inches, something. So if you got like a nice twelve to fourteen, Damn. keep that one maybe all the way <laughs> all the way whole, like in one slab. So you when you fry that, you can put it right on a po' boy. Because I do like I do like if I'm going to make a sandwich out of it, I like a whole slab if I can. Mm. You know what I mean? And not like separate pieces. If that makes sense. Nice. It makes a lot of sense. Nice. Okay, Tennessee. one more from our listener. Jimmy Magoo wants to know, what should I make with the hatch peppers I've been seeing at the store? Well, classic classic thing to do would be roast them over the fire, over like a wood-burning fire, um, you know, and then peel them, and then you could preserve them um, make in any way you want, just like in a mason jar. So, I mean, that's traditionally what they're used for, is they'll have whole hatch chili roasting festivals. Like, and you go to... Uh, New Mexico and in West Texas and so on, they'll literally have whole festivals devoted to the roasting of hatch chilies. <laughs> um, so you can always do that. And the way you would do that is you put it on any barbecue pit uh, or grill. And I, I would prefer charcoal or wood burning because I can get some of those flavors. You don't put any oil on them. Just go ahead and just blister them on all sides. And then once they're still hot, you can put them in a, like in a big gallon Ziploc bag or a big paper bag and roll them up and let them steam in there for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or until, until they're cool enough to peel. And the way you peel them is get a paper towel and just, like, use your thumb to rub that skin off. Do not rinse them. Uh, a lot of people rinse them, and that gets them cleaner, quote-unquote, but you rinse a lot of that flavor you've already kind of incorporated through the grilling and roasting and blistering process. So I like just to take my time, peel them with, like, rub that paper towel on the skin. It comes off pretty easily. And then you can preserve them from there in a, like, you can make that into salsa and then preserve them in a mason jar, or you can just cut them up and add a little vinegar and preserve them in a mason jar. Uh, and so that's personally what I would do. They do get a little hot. So, and if they're big enough, you can also stuff them with crab meat and shrimp and crawfish dressing or something like that and do a roast as well like you would a stuffed bell pepper. Mm. Uh, but they, they, they will get they're on the spicier side, typically, and much more spicy than, like, a typical bell pepper. So, Chef, I did turkey tacos last night, like t- ground meat turkey. I went 85-15 because I, I heard you want a little bit of that fat. Should I have drained it? Mm-hmm. Which I did not do because I validated myself with the turkey, but I feel like they came out a little little on the, uh, I don't want to say soggy side, but I didn't let them get all the way. I guess I should have drained them is what I'm asking. So 85, 15, uh, pro, like meat to fat content is what you're saying Yes, sir. right now. Yes, sir. And it was, it was, gra- <laughs> and it was ground turkey, and it was ground turkey breath. Yes. Uh, yeah. So here's the thing about ground poultry, even chicken or turkey. Um, it tends to have, especially turkey because basically like farm raised turkey, they'll pump with saline to keep it moist. Um, and that's your like, the one, so that's when you see, if you look on a package of a whole turkey, like that you get for Thanksgiving, you'll see like, um, you know, a certain percentage of added moisture mm-hmm. added on the label. That's because they're adding moisture to it by um, like injecting it with just like a saline, a salt solution or like a lightly salt. So anyways, like they do that with a lot of tur- They do that. Yep. Yeah, basically. They do that with a lot of turkey and even the stuff that comes in your grind, which produces a higher moisture content. So it's not your fat that's caused it to be soggy. It's the moisture content. And what you simply have to do is just cook it longer and let that moisture evaporate out of that pan before you end up putting all the rest of your seasonings in. Excellent. Thank you. Chef Jean-Paul Bourgeois. That's why we have him every Wednesday right here. Great knowledge. Come to him here for the uh, Jordy Collada Show weekly or check him out online at uh, jeanpaulbourgeois.com. You can catch the latest Duck Camp dinners on Meat Eaters YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to Meat Eaters YouTube and uh, keep up with the chef every week right here uh, with us. It's great to hear from you, man. We'll talk again next week.
Appreciate it, guys. Y'all have a great morning. All right. Yes, sir. Bye. There is uh, Chef Jean Paul Bourgeois. A lot of moist. Checking talk. in. Yes. Moist. A lot of. A lot uh, of girth talk. That's a word. A lot of soggy. 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 Yes, twelve inches. <laughs> Just, yeah. Yes. How about that firing off the uh, the regulation side of a speckle uh, regulation size what of a speckled trout? Are you, makes, what are you? That, that Some makes kind it of look at this guy. Yeah, it makes it easy to measure. Look at this guy. Nobody's gonna know the answer. Oh, you need a foot? He's like twelve inches. Should have told me. Twelve inches. What is that fish Italian? Daily, we're brought to you. No, I'm Italian. Daily, we're brought to you by RMB Builders. Remember, Rhett Bourgeois and his crew, RMB Builders, rmb-builders.com. Get in touch with you. Uh, uh, get in touch with him at uh, rmb-builders.com, where he can, handle, uh, he can handle anything. <laughs> uh, he can handle the uh, a total rehaul if you need a total. I, I just got a, uh, a text from uh, Rohan. Um, and wait, wait. We'll go around the room. Yeah, What's the verdict? Not yes. coming. Thumb down? Yeah. Thumb down, Thumb down. for me. Thumb down from you. Thumb down from Noah. It would be unanimous, and you would all be winners. Oh, uh, I hate to hear it. Man, yes. Rohan. Good morning, Jay. I have a sales meeting. I'll call you when I'm done. <laughs> what are you selling? Bro, What's what are you selling, bro? Did you ask him what are you selling? Because they ain't buying it either. Yeah, right. Please ask him what are you selling. Um, <laughs> R&B is selling construction. They can do it any type of way you need it. They can do total overhauls, reconstruction. They're they can also help house. you with, are they really? Wow, well, they just left my house. So uh, you can have them back. Uh, send them back when you're done. Uh, rmb-builders.com is the Jordy Collada show. Keeps them in business, but they have uh, a great business model, and they are very dependable. Uh, the work is excellent. Uh, it is easy to deal with Rhett and his crew. Uh, find out for yourself online, rmb-builders.com. That is Rhett Bourgeois over at rmb-builders.com. More of the Jordy Collada show when we come back. Noah's in the room. We got... Uh, nearly a full crew here as Jack is out uh, and today. Uh, yes, absolutely. Ah, those, are, those, those could play. You no, it was out at the practice field yesterday. Yes, yes, yes we yes, will talk yes. a little bit more LSU football as uh, Rohan has eluded us again in the open field. This <laughs> guy in the pocket, dude, he's just slipping and sliding. <laughs> feels like 2001 with Roe here on the Jordy Collada We're show. Alabama. Nick Underhill, 15 minutes from now, <laughs> driven and powered by Go Chevrolet. Go Chevrolet is proud to announce Go Express Auto Sales, the new used car lot located in the capital city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at 11522 Florida Boulevard. Go Express Auto Sales is online at goexpressautosales.com or you can search them on Facebook and social media at Go Express Auto Sales, the newest addition to the family of Go Chevrolet. Remember, Go Chevrolet is located down in Laplace, Louisiana, but now welcoming aboard Go Express, the new used car lot located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at 11522 Florida Boulevard. Papa Earl's, the fine spice, originating right down here in South Louisiana by our guy Mark Pop Norman. Developed it back in 2018 and won Amazon's Newcomer of the Year in 2019. They pride themselves in having 30% less salt and sodium than the leading brands at the same price point. You can find them locally. Look for Papa Earl's at Rouse's, Calandro's, Matherne's, High Neighbor, and more. A Bear Specialty Meats, home to the finest boudin in South Louisiana. Two spots right here in Baton Rouge and out in Prairieville. Stop in and see them in the Dutchtown Shopping Center on Highway 73 or right here in Baton Rouge on Jefferson Highway. Online, abearsmarkets.com, and they're all over social media. You can find them on Facebook. You can find them on Instagram. Abears combines perfect seasoning with that authentic Cajun flavor. Find out for yourself. Baton Rouge on Jefferson Highway and in Prairieville on Highway 73. abearsmarkets.com. GoFlow IV and Spa, 7970 Jefferson Highway is where you can find them, or you can simply go online to GoFlowIV.com. GoFlow IV Spa is a medical spa that specializes in IV hydration with vitamin infusion. At GoFlow IV Spa, they can help you with a wide range of issues, from skin care to illness recovery, athletic performance, hangover cure, chronic illness, and even chronic dehydration. 
GoFlowIV.com or stop in and see them. 7970 Jefferson Highway. Welcome back here to the Jordy Collada Show live on this Wednesday morning. Special thanks to Jean-Paul Bourgeois. We're going to talk to Nick Underhill in 15 minutes, get the latest from Saints Camp, as it seems like it is melting before our eyes down in Metairie. If it is not David Onyemata, it is Will Lutz getting surgery. If it's, my, uh, if it's not Mike Thomas bitching about something, it is Patrick Robinson retiring. It is one thing after another for the New Orleans Saints. We'll ask Nick Underhill how Peyton... Plans to navigate life after Breeze with so many stories being not about football here when he uh, joins us in a couple of minutes. Mail time is going to be bumped up that uh, that Rohan has left us at the altar again. Uh, Born lover. Yes. That's yes, fine. We are I'll be here when he wants to be That's here. Right. That's right. We've Just been, like Michael Thomas. We've told Ro I don't know why how we French. feel. Thomas Mike. Michael Thomas. We can't show any more, uh, we can't show any more action. I mean, all of our... Uh, Speaks for itself, Speaks right? For itself. I mean, we're here, man. If you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna hang out, we're you here. You can take the business <laughs> call Texas. here. Yeah, right. You don't have to text your sales us at, meeting. Take your sales yeah, meeting here. Right. <laughs> the text that uh, he was supposed to be here at eight thirty. Text comes at eight twenty-five. Just learned of the sales meeting mm. in the last five minutes, according to Rose text. They'll probably be late to it then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but we are answering your mail time questions. If you have any mailbag questions, if you have any mail time questions. Any way you can get in touch with us, which is a lot of ways, you can email us, you can direct message us, you can jump inside of the bunker. Hell, you can call us now. You can call us now. And leave a voicemail. Yeah, our um, phone number is on our website. We've got our phone number well, listed on the website. Is it just voicemails? No, uh, no we can actually call take text. calls on the air. And we were uh, thinking about our post-game show coming up during the football season. Uh, and we are still talking about who is going to co-pilot that with uh, with us because we do know that there is a space for uh, direct interaction with you after the uh, after the game, and we will be there. We will be there in some type of capacity. We are going to be there. We don't know what it's going to look like uh, or or uh, where it'll be, but it'll be it'll be everywhere you can find us. I mean, JordyColadaShow dot com, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, just how it's going to exist. But uh, I, we are in favor of opening up the phone lines and just kind of taking calls and interacting with people and going back and forth and giving our real-time thoughts on, on the LSU game. So hopefully um, we, can, uh, uh, we can give you uh, what we're going to look like coming up in postseason. And the booty calls with Kayshawn Booty. Uh, Boutte. Uh, <laughs> yes. No, no. We're good. We're good. Uh, just, uh, just jumping through the red tape. Uh, and, and we probably spoke a little too soon. As we do. As we do. That's kind of our style. And then, uh, you know, we can't use LSU's name or image anywhere in our relationship with Kayshawn. So, coming up this season, we're still working out the details, but it's going to work out. Kayshawn's going to be here once a week, and we're looking forward to it. Uh, but he can't be referenced as Kayshawn Butte, LSU's wide receiver. Right? Just wide receiver number one, like yeah, NCAA. WR1. WR number one. WR number one. <laughs> yeah, right. At a big time school. <laughs> yeah, you tell them you don't know who that is. Cornerback um, number seven. Yeah. So <laughs> that, is, that is definitely coming up here. And, and hopefully another athlete that we'll be able to announce as a part of the, uh, the Jordy Collada Show family uh, shortly after that. So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're doing a couple of things and getting ready for football season uh, over here and hopefully going to have some pretty cool segments and some pretty cool chats. Uh, Nick Underhill will be here weekly. Uh, Derek Stingley Sr. will be here weekly. Ross Dellinger will be here weekly. Uh, the chef, Jean-Paul Bourgeois, will be here weekly. Uh, and we will be talking to uh, a lot of people in and around the game. So we will have you covered uh, coming up for this SEC season and this LSU uh, football season. Uh, any uh, any mail yeah, time a questions of stuck out in there? The- 
What we in got? The doc. Uh, has Jordy thought about doing high school football via YouTube or the website? We have. Uh, we have talked about that. We're definitely going to have. Done. We're definitely going to have a game of the week where we go out. And we we watch a game and get some type of footage uh, from from a game at least early on. There's a lot of great matchups in the area. Uh, you know, Madison Prep, Quincy Wiggins taking on um, Carr, uh, Ricky Collins and Woodlawn. Uh, have one of the they've got to have the toughest schedule in the country I mean, in the state uh, when you just look at who they play uh, can you pull that up Noah and just kind of go week by week I, I believe before they even get to their district play um, I mean they play everybody I mean I'd love to go watch Walker Howard and say Thomas Moore play one Friday night uh, so yes we are definitely going to be in and uh, around prep football fields on Friday nights and plus I, I love taking little Jay to those atmospheres and those scenes and just kind of letting him run. It's very much um, down home, wholesome, feels good. Does feels he good. watch the game or run around no. and play football? No, does not. He's constantly playing. I mean, that's he gets, what, yeah, that's what gets, I in, that's gets into the car just yeah. ringing. Uh, well. Like he just played it's a awesome. game. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he just. Dad, I scored four touchdowns. Right. <laughs> four, four touchdowns. <laughs> right. Yeah. right, right, right. Now, right. we did to do the mail bag sounder, mail time sounder. Uh, yeah, hit it. Jesus Christ, Charlie. That right there is the mail. Now, let's talk about the mail. Can we talk about the mail, please, Mac? I'm dying to talk about the mail for you all day, okay? I gotta go up to his office. I gotta put his mail in the guy's goddamn hands. But they have been asking for their mail on a daily basis. It's all they're talking about up there. Because the mail never stops. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. There's never a let up. It's relentless. Every day it piles up more and more and more, and you gotta get it up. And the more you get out, the more it keeps coming in. And then the barcode reader breaks, and it's publishes clearing out. All right, all right, all right. All right. I can't believe I'm going to be a mailman. Great work, boy. Yeah, I mean, I did it. I might as well use uh, it. Right. I made um, this jacket. I'm going to wear it to the prom. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Has anybody seen my jacket? Yes, you see it. Play it. Um, so, yes, we, we look, I love high school football. I think that high school football is uh, a great... A form of entertainment in our state. It, it, it has uh, obviously a look into the future of some of the biggest uh, athletes and football players in the country. Uh, a lot of times, if you're following some of the biggest recruits, you'll show up on a Friday night and everybody will be on the sideline. Everybody from LSU to Georgia to Alabama, you'll see the big time schools down there watching uh, all these players. So uh, it'll be cool. I can't look, U High's defense. Yeah. U High is one of the teams that's kind of been. Um, not not so much forgotten about since their success under Chad Mahaffey and in that group, but uh, their defense, obviously led by the Allsbury brothers, um, is going to be pretty stout. I mean, and they they play St. Thomas More. They'll have to play Walker Howard. And if you talk to people around St. Thomas More's program, I mean, you high ask Rohan. Rohan's kid was on the uh, was on the field that night. Micah Davey was the the linebacker in the state semifinals last year versus St. Thomas Moore. And U High had the ball with, I believe, four minutes left and an opportunity to win the game, um, but just couldn't couldn't close it out. And Walker Howard and Jack Besh ultimately made a couple of plays at the end to get St. Thomas Moore the, the the state championship. But but U High feels like they're very close. They're those very re, close. those rematch games are the best. Yes, they are. When you have that bad taste in your mouth, especially you lose, like right. St. Thomas More loses a lot of key right. guys. You high feels like they're kind of coming up, changing of the guard. Yeah, right. 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 I mean, those It'll, atmospheres are the best. Yes, they're the best. I sent one of the videos of uh, Edna Carr's walkout to my brother Sean yesterday. He's like. F that dude! I'm going back on the bus. Like, <laughs> turn this thing around. Right? Never mind. Is that? It's is that unbelievable. It's unbelievable? How they sync up with the band, and you're just like, fuck this. <laughs> right. Five seven hundred and they, fifty pounds. They know everybody's staring at them. Oh, they you got they I mean? walking it's, them back. Just, oh. it's the best, man. It's the best. What else we got? Uh, let's see. Uh, who's the is Bowden the greatest CFB coach ever? If not, where do you rank him? Uh, obviously, it's Bobby Bowden earlier this week. Uh, sad news. Sunday morning, uh, college football and really sports in general lost a uh, just a titan, man. I mean, when you think about Bobby Bowden, I think about 1990s college football. To me, he is the face of the sport. He and Steve Spurrier in the 90s, kind of when I was becoming a sports fan, when I was becoming a college football fan, um, you know, Florida State was, was the best program in the sport. I mean, they dominated a decade. Uh, and even before that, uh, they were really the marquee name in college football. I was uh, a young student at Catholic High School. I went to Catholic High my freshman and sophomore year. And during that time, Travis Minor 
was the running back at Catholic High. Uh, and Miner was uh, the Gatorade National Player of the Year. He was the number one recruit in the country. He was the best running back in the country. Um, and Bobby Bowden, he ended up going to Florida State and starting as a true freshman. But Bobby Bowden was routinely at Catholic High's practice. He would be walking the halls during the day. Obviously, he had been there a couple of years earlier and gotten Warwick Dunn to attend Florida State when uh, Warwick Dunn was leaving and graduating from Catholic High. And I'll always remember, uh, time would almost like stop when you would see Bobby Bowden in the hall yeah. at that time. I mean, it was like 1996. I mean, it was Florida State was, he was Nick Saban. I mean, ultimately, I mean, he was, it would be like Nick Saban. I mean, we've seen all the videos and seen the reactions of Saban walking high school halls and what people do. It was like what Bobby Bowden is. I don't have him as the best coach ever. I, I have him as one of the best. Um, but he'll never be forgotten, I think, when you, you describe college football. I mean, his impact, his teams, the swagger, the... The the you know the the draw dead gummit I mean just the the <laughs> the likability I mean he was very um, polarizing he was very, yeah he was great man he was he was fantastic he will out he will definitely be missed I don't have him as the best Nick Saban to me is the best college football coach ever he will be that for a long time um, I think Bobby Bowden Jimmy Johnson on that list of uh, best yeah. for sure he should have sure. never left should have never left should have never left the Cowboys I mean really. oh he didn't have a choice. Jerry knows. You that. see Jerry Jones drinking that water. He looked Jerry. like a lizard in the sun. <laughs> Jerry looks. He was, <laughs> Jerry looks at these. Jerry's got. He was so thirsty. He didn't couldn't find the the feeder. It was so weird. He's just so dry. He looks so bad. You see how much salt he put on his sandwich? Yes, I. And he oh was salting like bite by bite. You could he definitely. Was. He was doing like, and it's a McDonald's. I've like never that's, seen anything like I that. I mean, before. how Me old either. is how old is Jerry? Who's to tell? How old is Jerry? Take a guess. Eighty-eight. I'd say he's between eighty-five and ninety. It's too much salt, bro. Way too much salt. And eating McDonald's. 78. Se- what? 78. He, does he look good then? No, he does not. <laughs> he looks 78. He looks Yeah, I mean, I guess it, I mean, right? he looks 78. How but old? he looks like he is fighting to look better, which is making him look worse. I mean, his plastic <laughs> surgery is caught up with him, in my opinion. You know what I mean? And I'll look, watch out, Tom. All water finds its level. You're looking at the- <laughs> this is the first picture that popped up with Jerry Jones. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Groping. Oh. Some flight attendant. <laughs> um, okay, the chair. Jordy, who do you see taking the punt and kickoff return jobs for LSU? Uh, punt returner early on will be Stingley. I think they'd like it to be Trey Palmer. Can't and I think the him. kickoff returner will be Trey Palmer because of the success that he had last year. I think you'll probably see a running back back there with him. Uh, John Emery. Yeah, I was thinking um, of Palmer and Emery. Yeah, probably John I'm Emery. I'm going to say probably... Armani Goodwin because they're going to let it go to Palmer let this guy run up and clock somebody. That seems to be like Possibly. the method. You know, you want Possibly. one man. Look, deep. I know this. They want to get Armani Goodwin on the field. Right. Yes. And maybe that's an opportunity it, to do that. If you kick it to him, that's yeah. your fault. Yeah, maybe they, maybe maybe that's it. Anything else? Uh, what about the NFL saying they will enforce strictly taunting? Um, and we have have you seen this? Dog? Yeah. They released a five-minute video of what taunting is and what taunting isn't and sent it to the officials and said, use your best discretion. <laughs> They're going to police these athletes yeah. and tell them what's cool and what's not cool. Uh, why, why is this happening in I sports? Why, I don't understand this. I, I, I understand that the NFL, the NBA... They would tell you behind closed doors or maybe even publicly that they're trying to salvage the corporate relationships that they may have. And I understand that that's the backbone of the business. And that's how you make this amount of money. But if I'm describing my product to corporate America and I'm selling them on supporting and being a partner of ours, I'm not, I'm not by any means trying to explain that we're going to turn into some you know, like it, it, it's going to be this 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 form of entertainment that you've never seen. But I'm also saying you've got to allow these guys to be themselves if you really want to capitalize on the product. I, I think by policing it as hard as they try to do, and 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 and, and ruling with such an iron fist that it it's it's such a turnoff. I mean, it's 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 such a turnoff to think. That in a big game like last night, like in, in the in the in the malice at the palace, 
the fact that look our test he has the reputation of being that guy but the fact that the eastern conference finals was really judged jured and executioned on that call even in 2004 right. i was thinking like that is that's terrible like the fact that the official was that much of the storyline in the Eastern Conference Finals to me would be more embarrassing for the league than it would be to say that you're protecting the brand and the image and a guy like Artest can can throw an elbow where if you're just looking at that real time and you think to yourself, I've got to make a flagrant call right here, like a flagrant foul call. To decide and the who first, goes to the finals. And decide who's going to go to the finals. And like Reggie Miller said, those were the two best teams. Whoever wins that series is going to win a championship. Right. Come to find out, Pistons shock the world, but don't really shock anybody within the league right. by beating L.A. with Kobe, Carl Malone, Sh- Gary, Gary Payton, Payton, Shaq. I mean, um, but it, this this turns into... But then you think about a football game coming down to the end and coming down in a huge scenario of... I mean, it would be like the NOLA no-call being a taunting foul. Like, you're in that moment of the game, right. and that's on the line. Think about the reaction of... I mean, I was walking out of the Dome that day. It was... It was it was like zombie. I mean, people were like, the day of the dead. no way that just happened. No. And to think if that could happen over a taunting call is amazing. Sean was at that game also. He said he saw a guy <laughs> just launch himself down the escalator full, full head first. Like, just didn't even care. He was like, I'm just walking down it. Didn't walk, just went and just took off down the escalator, slid down, rolled, rolled around and got up and just kept walking. There, He's were, like, there were points of the tunnel walking down that I thought there was going to be brawls. Like, I thought there was going to be melees. People were cussing at Roger Goodell, cussing at the NFL, dog cussing any Rams fan that went by. Then you went through, like, a section of people that were almost in tears, like, devastated to a point where they were almost crying. And then when you got to the the release of the building kind of the doors of it. And I'm walking, it's me and Jordan. I've got Jordan's hand. And Jordan's like, you know, he's looking at all this like, <laughs> where am I? You know, like, like, holy cow, people care this much about sports. I can see it in his <laughs> eyes. Like, this is an awakening. This is, a, this is amazing that people obsess this much over sports. And like, I mean, he just kind of sees it through an eight-year-old prism at that point. You know what I mean? Like, Drew Brees and Mike Thomas and Alvin Kamara are cool. You know, and they lost today, and it was, t- it was devastating. But, and then when you broke the building and got out, like, into the flood of the streets and the ramp down to Poydra Street, it was like The Walking Dead. It was like zombies. It was like people were just, I, I never forget, I like, me and a guy just kind of made <clears throat> eye contact, and he kind of, we didn't, we didn't know each other, and he kind of looked at me, and it kind of like, it was like, I can't believe that just happened. You know what I mean? Like, I can't believe we're leaving with a loss, is what he said. I'll never forget, like, I can't believe we're leaving this game with a loss. And, I mean, it was... There's nothing we can do about it. There was, it was over. Yeah. It was over. I mean, I remember there was that, that press conference with Peyton where he's, like, yelling at the officials in the in the, in the the tunnel. Like, almost, like, begging them to get back on the field. Like, Fix it. don't let right. this happen. Do not let this happen. And... That scene, and when Joe Oliva and F. King Alexander walked into the Vanderbilt game the day that Will Wade was suspended were two of the most just craziest sports atmospheres I've ever been a part of. I thought that they were going to, I thought they were going to mob Joe Oliva. I really, I mean, I thought they were going to, I thought they were going to hang him at the stake. Like, I thought they were going to, like, (laughs) dream down to midcourt and, like, I mean, (laughs) sacrifice this guy, man. I mean, just, like, stone him to death. (laughs) Take the basketballs and use them as stones and just, like, hang run. Out, hang, hang out under the rim. I mean, F you, Joe. F you, unbelievable. Joe. At raining down on him. I mean, just like. And he was eating it up. He was in shock. Yeah, he was just like. Uh, I mean, in the second half, he never showed his face. Well, he yeah, stood he, in the he tunnel. Would have been dead. I mean, I kind of gave him credit for. Showing up. Me yeah, too. Really and truly. I mean, 
But those were two of the, the, the atmospheres in sports. So is it time uh, to get to Nick Underhill now? It is. We're late to get to Underhill. Let's do that. Uh, Daily, we're brought to you by A Bear Specialty Meats. A Bear Specialty Meats is uh, located over on Jefferson Highway in Baton Rouge and in Prairieville out in uh, uh, in Gonzales. Highway 73 out there. Stop in and see them. Dutchtown Shopping Center. Fee- uh, the freezer has great selections. Uh, speaking of high school football on Friday nights and college football on Saturdays and NFL on Sundays. A-Bears will have a fantastic selection of tailgate packages to choose from to get you set up for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They'll also be a great pickup for anybody heading to the duck camp or the deer camp coming up this fall. So we got you taken care of over at A-Bears. A-Bears Specialty Meets Baton Rouge and in Prairieville on Highway 73. Nick Underhill talking New Orleans Saints to close us out next here as uh, we are driven and powered by Go Chevrolet. Papa Earl's, the fine spice. A Bear's specialty meats, home to the finest boudin in South Louisiana. Two spots right here in Baton Rouge and out in Prairieville. Stop in and see them in the Dutchtown Shopping Center on Highway 73 or right here in Baton Rouge on Jefferson Highway. Online, abearsmarkets.com, and they're all over social media. You can find them on Facebook. You can find them on Instagram. Abears combines perfect seasoning with that authentic Cajun flavor. Find out for yourself. Baton Rouge on Jefferson Highway and in Prairieville on Highway 73. abearsmarkets.com. Go Flow IV and Spa, 7970 Jefferson Highway is where you can find them, or you can simply go online to goflowiv.com. GoFlow IV Spa is a medical spa that specializes in IV hydration with vitamin infusion. At GoFlow IV Spa, they can help you with a wide range of issues, from skin care to illness recovery, athletic performance, hangover cure, chronic illness, and even chronic dehydration. GoFlowIV.com or stop in and see them, 7970 Jefferson Highway. Welcome back in here to the Jordy Collada Show, closing us out with the best in the business covering the New Orleans Saints. The only one you need to follow as far as Saints coverage goes. New Orleans.football is the website. A new podcast is up. You got to be a member to listen to the podcast, and it is worth the membership. Get it today. If you care about the Saints, if you're worried about the Saints Jeez. at this point, geez. Hopefully, Underhill can maybe help him out with a little uh, psychiatry at this point. I mean, the place seems like it's melting without Drew Brees. Yesterday, Patrick Robinson announced he's retiring. Mike Thomas seems to be at the neck of the franchise. They're going back and forth publicly. Uh, David Anyamata is going to have to miss some time this year. Marshawn Lattimore is going to have to miss some time. Will Lutz is having groin surgery. Uh, Did I miss anything, Nick Underhill? Good morning. How are you? Uh, Deontay Harris is going to miss some time due to the uh, DUI arrest. So, yeah, the, the list just keeps going and going. Um, I mean, you, Sean Payton in this situation, I think everybody had a lot of confidence in Payton being that he was he, he was the head coach to navigate life after Drew Brees. But wh- where where does this offseason start for you? I mean, there there's a lot of stories before you even get to the practice field on New Orleans here in the second week of training camp. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. Look, I mean, if you want to sell hope, I mean, I guess the thing that you could say is that a lot of this stuff is, is temporary and guys like Anyamata, uh, Deontay Harris, Will Lutz, you know, all this stuff, eventually they'll be back. And if you can weather those first six games and get to three and three by beating teams like, you know, Washington and Carolina and uh, the Giants, maybe you're in a situation where the Calvary comes back and, and everything looks good but it just feels like the weight of the world is, is just coming down on the team and it's just day after day hit after hit 
And, you know, it, it's a ton of stuff to sort through, like you said. And, man, it, it, you know, when when everybody was on the team and everybody was healthy and you're looking at it through the perfect prism of the offseason, if this goes right, that goes right, it looked like, you know, a lot of stuff could line up and be okay for this team. I think reality is hit fast and hard and probably harder than anyone could have really expected at this point in the offseason. And, look, I, I think Sean Payton's going to have to have the, the season of his career to make this work and to get through those first six games and look he might be able to do it I mean there's still some talented players on the team but there's still some really big holes so I think you know if they can go out here and they can find a way to get another cornerback at least I think that maybe you have a chance to get into that three and three spot but it's you know just realistically it just it just feels like there's a lot that they're up against and a lot that they're gonna have to overcome to have this be the 10 11 12 win season that I think they were hoping for when they were fighting so hard to keep the, the uh, team together this offseason as they tried to get cap compliant. Nick, unpack the Mike Thomas stuff. For How, how did we get here? I, I recall Mike Thomas and Sean Payton talking about their love for Jordans publicly was kind of their relationship a couple of years back. How did they get to a point where they're bickering back and forth in the public? You know, I just think a lot's happened over the, the last year. And it, you know, I, know, I know people don't want to listen to the media and they, they think people are spending stuff up, and that's fine. If you, if you want to erase all that and... and just look at the, the pure facts of the situation. He gets suspended last year for punching Chauncey Gardner-Johnson in practice. And that wasn't just like a, you know, pull up from a play and punch. It's like play had ended. This had been simmering through practice for a little while. Mike walks across the field and punches him. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a heat of the moment thing. It was like, you know, it, the way it was described to me is that it was a sucker punch. And, you know, that, that he gets suspended for that, gets injured. He's out. He's sitting. That situation's kind of festering. And then he tries to come back, gets hurt again. And, you know, you're in this situation where you got to get the surgery and Mike was supposed to get surgery. He, they tried to do a conservative form of action. It didn't, you know, obviously work so, because he has gotten the surgery. But there was no contact really with the team for, for a period of time. He missed an appointment with a doctor is, is what I was told. And then, mm. you know, there's no contact. And then when he's mandated to come back for mini camp, they get a look at the ankle finally. Bo Lowry and that staff and Bo, you know, I know the Saints medical staff has a reputation from stemming from like the Delvin Bro thing, but it, it was a whole new medical staff and these guys were good enough that they got hired away. LSU thought enough of Bo Lowry yeah. to hire him to oversee everything. So that isn't, you know, some shaky doctor and Mike was seeing independent surgeons anyhow. So like this wasn't a team doctor thing. So I, you know, this in fairness of Bo Lowry and them, I, I think that needs to be you know, very clear, but so he comes back, he has to get the surgery and you know, just this week, there's a social media post about, you know, Mike, Mike put up that, that comment about how he felt like the team kind of slandered him and, and was ruining his reputation. So, you know, here you are, and there's all this stuff that's happened, and, you know, they're kind of at odds right now. And I would say that, you know, people talking about trades and that, you know, that might be a little premature. There might be a reality where this just goes on. Mike gets on the field, he's playing, he makes some plays, he's getting the stats, they're winning games, everybody feels good. You have that kumbaya moment. Maybe there's there's a phone call at some point where this gets smoothed out or a face to face meeting. Um, you know, I, I would I would probably have every option on the table and I would be prepared for anything to happen at this point because it kind of feels, you know, that shaky and maybe that that perilous. Trading him would be really hard. A, you got to find somebody that wants to trade for an injured player, a guy that really hasn't been right for a year. B, you got to find someone that <laughs> you know wants to take on a guy that that. You know, all this stuff is going on around that. That didn't talk to his team, allegedly, for three months. And see the contract. The Saints, if they trade him right now, it's $32 million in dead money, $9 million and some change will go on the books this year, $22 million next year. You know, I think as we look at this team and, and, and how they operate, they've never been a team that, that's made decisions based strictly on the salary cap, and they don't believe in the second pass fallacy. They'll sign Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham becomes a problem, and, and they trade him. Junior Gallette, same thing. So, if it's a situation where they feel like he doesn't need to be in the building, I don't think the money stops him. But I think in the end, if everybody were to take a step back and, and calm down and look at it, I think Mike Thomas is best in the situation here. And I think the Saints are best with Mike Thomas. So I think if you can find a way to work it out, that would be the best thing. But look, a lot has happened. And I think the thing that hurts is that he's not playing. He's, he's not practicing. He's injured. He's, he's not doing any, he's, he's rehabbing on his own. You know, if, if it's just kind of sitting there and festering. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, that kind of hurts the situation the most. 
Nick Underhill, New Orleans dot football. Make sure you're following him on Twitter at Nick underscore Underhill. As the latest podcast is up on the website, you can catch it there. Make sure and get your subscription here in training camp. Uh, I, this might be a stupid question, but is the Patrick Robinson story now bigger? But just because of the the the, the lack of bodies and and how dire that position is on the roster at cornerback. No, no man, that that is exactly it. It's, it's more dire because it's the lack of depth and all that stuff. And even before Patrick Robinson went out, they were looking to try to find somebody to bring in to, to you know possibly start at that number two spot, at least compete at it. The quality of cornerback that you can trade for right now, you know, it's it, it's it's tough. Like, you know, Stephon Gilmore is someone that I think everybody in the league that needs a corner is looking at, but realistically, are the Patriots actually going to trade him? I, I think that would be tough. So then your guys like C.J. Henderson, the hard net guy in Oakland that's fallen down uh, the third string on the depth chart, maybe one of the Broncos cornerbacks. Those are the guys you're kind of looking at. And, and you know, I don't think anybody that, that's available right now is an absolute surefire starter, but their depth at that position is, is weak. You know, I think Ken Crawley was, was kind of pushing up on Robinson a little bit. But you take one of those guys out, and Lattimore gets suspended, and now you got Ken Crawley, Paulson, and Debo starting at cornerback. If you get an injury, you're starting a guy nobody's ever heard of at, at that point. And, mm. you know, that, that's a tough situation to be in. So, yeah, taking, taking that guy out, that body out, I think is, is a big deal. In that sense, in a vacuum, you know, losing him as your starter, like, no, I mean he's you know he's he is who he is at this point, and he's a replaceable player. But yeah. again, you don't you don't really have a lot of guys that can replace him, and your depth is super thin. So, yeah, I think that that's a huge deal for a team that was already treating cornerback like it was it was a dire position. What's the latest on quarterback? What are you seeing out there? It's back and forth. You know, I I think that you know that there's days where you look at Jameis Winston and and you can be convinced that he's he's the guy. You know, yesterday he had a throw that was just you know I. I was ready to say, you know, that that was a, a job-winning throw. He, he got uh, pressured in the pocket, spun out, hit a throw on the run 20 yards up the sideline. Um, it was a Patrick Mahomes-type throw, and then you know, he gets out there, his next drive, and it's, it's four downs and out and no first down, and, and it kind of ends. So, you know, I, I think if either one of these guys built a little bit of momentum, it, it would make it a little bit easier to evaluate. But, you know, it's one day James is good, one day's pace is good. You know, I think part of that, too, is that they go back and forth. Two days is started with the first team, two days with the second team. And look, I mean, Traquan Smith's hurt. Mike Thomas is, is is hurt. You know, So those guys on the second team in a normal year, the wide receivers on the second team, those are your guys that are playing in the fourth preseason game, you know, fighting for a job. And here they are out here, you know, trying to get open and separate against the second team defense, which, you know, has some legitimate players on it. So just kind of the quality, I think, of those weapons kind of makes it hard to evaluate when these guys are with the second team. And it's very easy to be, like, hard on, you know, Jameis Winston for going 8-16 to 16 or something with the second team. But you're throwing at Jalen McCluskey and, and, you know, other guys that who might have a shot at making the team, but those aren't, you know, they aren't, they aren't your normal second team players. Uh, so it's, you know, just to put it in perspective, Marquez Calloway right now is the number one guy in camp last year. He would have been the guy running with the second team or maybe the third team. So it's just you don't have a lot of guys at wide receiver that can separate. And, you know, I think that's a big issue, too. I, you know, they, they act like it, it, it's fine and it's something they can get through. And, look, I, I trust Sean Payton's scheme. He's schemed players open for, for years. He made Willie Sneed look like someone that deserved to be in a Pro Bowl. He made Lance Moore, yeah. you know, someone that, that people think is, is like a legendary player. And they were, like, in their own right while they were here. So he might be able to get these guys open, but, you know, as far as in practice where things aren't highly schemed and, and you're counting on people to separate, I think it makes it hard to evaluate quarterbacks because there's just that lack of talent at that position. Can they overcome the Lutz injury? <laughs> Man, this is all doom and gloom today. We aren't telling any hope. Huh? <laughs> That'd be a positive to talk about. <laughs> I mean, Malcolm Roach seems like a stud the Baton Rouge kid can play, huh? No, he does look good. I, I think he's like the probably the, the number one uh, nose tackle right now. I think he's gotten a lot better, yeah. and, and he does look set to take that. Yeah, as far as Lutz, I, I think it's a big deal. I mean, yeah. you're talking about a team that's probably going to have a little bit of trouble driving, and right. you're going to get in the spots where, where you got to settle for more field goals, and he's someone they trust. He's automatic. He, you know, he missed, I think, three field goals last year because the ball was spotted around the laces. He hit the laces when he when he kicked. And, you know, Thomas Morstead was a spotter. He got LASIK surgery after the, the season because he was having trouble season seeing. So I think you can maybe put two and two together there. And, mm-hmm. you know, that was why some of the shakiness happened. But, yeah, I mean, look, the guy they brought in, he, he, he hasn't played in the NFL since 
2019. He has a career 76% field goal percentage. So uh, Maher is going to get the first shot at that job. But I think this is probably something where, you know, a lot of teams have two, two kickers in camp. So the top 50 or so kickers walking the planet are, are signed right now. There's going to be a bunch of guys that get cut at the end of the preseason. So I think that, that they'll kind of have to look and sort through that. And, you know, hopefully they can bring somebody in that's, that, you know, an 80, 85% kicker and, and they kind of roll like that. That's how they got Will Lutz, uh, to begin with. Yeah. Um, they, they're going to be up from Baltimore this week. They got two kickers. You know, John Harbaugh is the best, uh, special teams coach in the NFL. Head coach came up as a special teams guy. So, you know, they're going to get a good look at some people. I think they'll probably have to bring someone else in before the start of the season. But yeah, losing Lutz, the guy you trust with the way Peyton is impatient with kickers, I think it's a huge deal. And it's definitely, definitely like one or two on the list of things they got to overcome in the short term. Harbaugh tipped him off on Lutz, didn't he? He did, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a good relationship there. So, if this, this other guy is any good, I mean, it, their ticker isn't going anywhere. So, I mean, they'll get a good look at somebody that, that might have a shot uh, this weekend. Uh, I'll get you out on this. What, what is one positive thing that you have seen? If, if I was asking you for good news out there, what is what, what would you what would you feed back? We'll see if this is like a real thing or not. But if they had drafted Jawan Johnson, he was a wide receiver last year. I'm drafted guy they brought in. They moved him to tight end. He's balked up to 240. If he was a drafted player on this team and he was having the camp that he's having, the hype would just be blowing the roof off. I mean, he, he's he's been excellent in this camp. He's had four touchdowns in the last two days. Probably had the best play at camp yesterday. Touchdown pass from uh Taysom Hill, he went up and over a linebacker on a seam route, made a leaping catch, brings it in, scores a touchdown. Just a real big body guy. Um, you know, he's still learning the block a little bit. The blocking's coming along. I think it's passable by the season. It might be better. I don't, you know, he's not going to be like an inline guy, but in that two minute offense or in other situations where they, you know, they have two tight ends on the field and they flex one out. Um, you know, I think he's going to have a lot of opportunities to make plays. And if we're seeing early on in this camp, and look, he's, he's, working with the first team going against the first team defense. So making catches on like the Mario Davis isn't, it isn't a joke. So if he's able to carry that on and keep playing at this level, when when it actually matters, I think that they found a player and and got him in a spot where he can uh, contribute to the team early on. And Quan looks good, right? Quan Alexander being out there. I mean, just the fact that he's out there is incredible. Yeah, he's, he's, you know, seven months removed the way he's moving. It's, it's impressive. He's, he's done a little bit of individual drills you know before they go into team stuff or real competitive periods he's moving around a little bit it looks like he's moving all right i'd be lying if i said like you know he's pushing off both legs exactly the same it looks a little bit but look to be seven months to be out there running to be able to push off the cut to go through these drills i think he's he's significantly ahead of schedule i don't know if he's going to be ready by you know mid-september when the season starts but i think there's a, there's a shot i mean it, it, it's 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 crazy to see what he's able to do right now. And the way he's feeling, I'm, I'm not going to doubt him at all. So, yeah, that linebacker's up with him on the on the chart. You know, at first I was like, hey, like, they just drafted Pete Werner in the second round. They, they traded up to get Zach Bond the year before. Like, why, why do you have to do this? Look, I think it makes sense. Werner's already hurt. I mean, he's, he's battling a, a right leg injury. I don't think it's serious. But that depth of linebacker with Quan on there, I mean, I think that, that was a position that was shaky that now looks like potentially a position of strength. Now, depth-wise, and then in the future, I think they got good prospects. So, we got uh, we got two hopeful things going on here amidst all the uh, bad stuff happening for this yeah, game. That is good. Saints are at Baltimore this Saturday. Uh, Nick Underhill covers the Saints, and he covers it better than anybody else. New Orleans dot football. He's got great relationships and great information. You'll hear him weekly here on the Jordy Colada Show, which we are fired up about. He will be our exclusive uh, Saints insider. Uh, you can hear him everywhere. You can read his work at neworleans.football. The podcast is live as it was last night, but it's already up, and you can get it there on the site. Uh, you got to be a, uh, a, a member. You got to subscribe. Uh, get the subscription and uh, let Nick know that you uh, you heard him right here on the Jordy Collada Show. Neworleans.football is the website. Uh, thank you, man. We'll talk again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take it easy, guys. Always. There is uh, Underhill checking in this morning. Uh, from New Orleans. I mean, I hated the doom and gloom, but, I mean, it took me... How do you get to a positive story? I mean, you got to go down the storylines of what is affecting the Saints right now, and all of them are shitty. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, to me, I, I don't know what's a bigger story. I, I really don't. It, it, Lutz might be the biggest story because of what Underhill just described. You lose Breeze. You lose that confidence of being able to 
you know, kind of punch it in or, or, or being able to score with the capability that you have been over the last couple of years, you've got a really dependable and trustable kicker that has developed a reputation that he can knock it in from just about anywhere that you need him to. And a week in a training camp, he's out for 12 weeks. I mean, how do you overcome that in the locker room, first off? I mean, that guy's had a, 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 a really good reputation in the locker room. How do you just replace that and get the production that he's given you? Mike Thomas is arguably the best wide receiver in the league. Right now, he wants off the team. He wants to be traded, it seems like. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like he wants to be there. Uh, and then cornerback, which was a high position of need going into the draft. You land on Peyton Turner, the defensive end, which seems like he's been a positive note too as well here early in training camp. But you didn't draft a corner, and you still need a corner. Before Patrick Robinson gives you the news that he's retiring, you were shopping the market for corners. I mean, Patrick Robinson's really not even a corner. You know what I mean? And you had him starting there opposite. I, I don't. What is the biggest story? I mean, what, what, which one hurts you the most? Uh, to me, they all are. I mean, take Mike Thomas away from the Saints' offense. That's a huge story. Take the second cornerback off of the team due to retirement in training camp. That's an enormous story. Take the Pro Bowl kicker off of the uh, off of the team in training camp due to an injury that's going to take 12, 12 weeks to rehab. That's a huge story. They're dealing with all three of those right now. If you have one of those, that's a story. If you have all three, it's it, it's Chicken Little. I mean, the sky is absolutely falling in on New Orleans. It seems like there's just everywhere you turn, it's something bad that's going to happen. You almost want to pack it up and just let's end this training camp early. I hope not. Go Bengals, baby. At least we got another squad. Who day? Who day? <laughs> Who day? Absolutely. Going to change letters a little bit. That's, that's right. easy. That's, that's right. easy adjustment. Um, get over to GoFlow Ivy and Spa. They're located on Jefferson Highway, 7970 Jefferson Highway. They got memberships available, three months, six month, and annuals. It's time for us to get back over there. It is. To, I uh, the last to one. go flow. Oh, uh, I'm sluggish. telling you, man, the sleep. The sleep. Yeah, y'all, you can get over there. You can get over there. I'm going to tap it up. Uh, yeah, I wore, yeah, I wore right. a little GoFlow shirt to practice yesterday. Did, Did you? Yeah. What did you see yesterday, Noah, before we get out of here? Anything oh, pop? Uh, I hate to put you on the spot. I not, saw that you uh, you looked at those wide receivers. You had Ryan receivers, Thomas, wide receivers Malik look Neighbors. The wide receivers is probably the deepest, other than D-line. It's probably D-line and receivers that is the deepest position rooms. Um, safeties look good. Yeah. Derek safeties. Davis was uh, no longer in a yellow non-contact jersey. He I saw his. Besh was. Besh was in one, and Emory mm-hmm. was out of one. So there's a lot of yeah. a lot of movement. But Besh has been strictly with tight ends since we've gone. He hasn't worked with receivers that we've seen. Um, but, yeah, and then Cole Taylor is huge. Yeah. I didn't realize how big he was. He I, is saw six, Cole, seven? I saw Cole Kubelik put top out his three? top, top five uh, number breakout players. players in the SEC. He's got Cole Taylor number three. Oh, what I saw was just from that one little snippet to Cole Taylor, that little motion boot out. Hit Cole yeah. Taylor over the middle. Yeah. I just liked all the action yeah. that was going yeah. on. It wasn't yeah. very vanilla at all. No. Even... Johnson looks very good rolling he right. He does. <laughs> Since he's, I mean, he's he left-handed, does. so he's throwing. Against the grain. Yeah, and he looks I good mean, throwing. I mean, I'm telling you, the quarterback competition wasn't close. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not kicking a guy while he's down. Miles Brennan, they need Miles Brennan to win games at points this year, I think. Are but, they going to switch the offense? Do you go, you want him rolling left, huh? Or do you um, think he can just do both? It looks like he can do both. Yeah, I think he but can I do tell both. you what, Nussmeyer might be my favorite player. Really? Because he's got like a little. Yeah, he's got that. I mean, he, yeah, he's got he that. He throws juice, sidearm man. just sit, standing there. He's got like, that. Those juice do a little dump oh, off to like the back. Swag. And just, yeah. yeah, he's, he's flicking got, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love that. Pays attention to what he looks like That's every fine. day. That's fine. Every a little black for no reason. Got to got to look good to play good. Yeah. Got to look good to play good. Yes, I love a good looking practice player too. Somebody that cares about it in practice too. And then um, yesterday was the first time that I saw Coach O, like actually saw him there. Like you, I mean, he's been with the D line, and uh-huh. they're like all the way on the other side from where we stand. But yesterday they kind of did like, like Flip pump up, pump up a little bit before the game. You can hear him yelling, obviously, and see him walking around. Then I was able to see the D line work a little bit. So that's a deep Very group. Cool. They are huge, yeah. and I mean, it's just guys on guys. On yeah, guys. yeah, they're deep, man. They got numbers. Um, can't tell who's coming in and coming out. It's a great thing. That is. Off day today? Yes, They're off today. No practice today. Back at it tomorrow. Uh, so we'll have you covered. Been doing a great job on that social media stuff. Yeah. Keep that stuff up, man. Uh, a lot Next of interaction. First scrimmage Saturday? First scrimmage on Saturday. First scrimmage on Saturday. 
if you can get in there, I'll give you a raise. <laughs> <laughs> you might lose your credentials. Yeah, that's right. Come back with us tomorrow, <laughs> 7 a.m., Jordy Collada Show. Have a great day. We're driven and powered by Go Chevrolet. Stop in and see Lee Carney and Nick Richard. In fact, I'm meeting Nick Richard for lunch today at Phil's Oyster Bar, if you want to tag along. Uh, we will be there uh, catching up with Nicky as uh, he is in town. Um, great kicks. Me? I just saw him on, on, on TV yeah, for the I've first time. I've had these. How's it going? Oh, these old things. <laughs> these old things. <laughs> these old things. Act like you've been around these for a while. All right, we'll be back tomorrow morning at 7 a.m.